my my uh, my computer says eleven o'clock. I hear my downstairs clocks chiming. So uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll tell you the story, Andy. Matthias, over here. All right. Former car. <laughs> oh. Ow. <laughs> All right, Matthias, kick us off. I think it's we're good to go. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather Spring 21 meeting in virtual forum. And uh, yeah, Matt, why don't you tell us this picture, what the story is? You see on the left my picture from Boulder. It's gray, rainy, which is actually great for a change rather than snow because the ground needs some moisture. But you had also something storm related there that caused this thing. So why don't you explain that photo yeah, there, Matt? Yeah, so uh, so for those of you here who were here yesterday, uh, I apologize for repeating myself, but it's been an interesting spring here in uh, in Northwest Metro Atlanta. We've had uh, actually, the, I'm guessing an average kind of amount of rain, but uh, some of it has come in, in, in you know, in, in large chunks. And, and when it does that and then is followed by wind, trees that aren't feeling 100 percent sometimes give up the ghost and, um, and, 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 and come unrooted. In this case, about a 125 foot oak tree in my backyard uh, came, came unrooted uh, in a strong northwest wind uh, on the backside of a, of a spring cold front and, um, and split the difference between my house and my neighbor's house literally did not damage any, any portion of our houses, but it did take out a, um, a, a crepe myrtle, a couple of sections of fence, a Japanese maple, and nearly cleaved my work truck sitting in the driveway in two. Um, now, so that's the bad news. The, the good news is that the tree is gone, the truck is gone, um, and and because it took the crepe myrtle down, I now have a place to to mount a weather station and 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 expect reasonably accurate rainfall uh, information from it. Uh, and that's the picture there on the kind of upper right. So so from this tragic incident came a, an opportunity to. To, uh, to, to, to once again have a, a weather station at my house and, and have it be reasonably accurate. So there you go, that, that's my weather story for the spring. But that's another good news for all the low level flying pilots out there. There is an additional weather piece of information that you can tap into and access in your cockpit if you're so equipped to do. That's right, that's right. As, as a matter of fact, if you go to ambientweather.net or weather underground and uh, know where I live and search on the right station, you'll see my little my little uh, ambient uh, 2902C just churning out information. I have to point out that was so a very Matt, smart tree because it took careful aim. If it it could not have aimed any better at your truck. Yep. Uh, Matt, as you know, this is Bill Bauman. I have a crepe myrtle that's partially blocking my wind sensor as well. So if you could send me some severe weather to take the crepe myrtle out, my wife won't let me cut it down. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Bill, if I can arrange that, that I'm in the wrong field and need to be doing something way different than I'm doing. <laughs> that's true. Very true. But Bill, you already have a weather station. Yes, but I have a crepe myrtle that's just as tall as my wind sensor, and when the leaves come out, it blocks the wind from the east. <laughs> it's okay. the conundrum of the neighborhood weather station. It's called very location-specific weather. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Matt, do you want to go to the next slide so we get started with the program for today? Yep. Uh, we have a full... Uh, Day again ahead of us with one major segment focused on emerging standards and certification challenges for novel weather observations that Steve Dar will be leading with his uh, panelists. And then uh, later we will have a shorter update segment uh, from ongoing topics that Tom Ryan uh, will be shepherding. And just a few housekeeping things here. The meeting will be recorded as in the past. Please use the chat room to 
submit your questions or comments and Dave Strand uh, will be monitoring that and uh, manage bringing up the questions and comments at the appropriate times. So he is the steward of that. Please your, your, mute your microphones if you're not speaking. That will really help uh, minimize uh, background noise and the speakers and the listeners will be greatly appreciating that. And uh, last but not least, we have a planning meeting on May 12th. And please submit your topics online. You see the link there to the FPA.aero webpage, where you can also register to be, uh, become a member or especially be on the email list for information of future meetings and what's going on. And uh, let's see, did we cover everything, Matt? Yeah, I think so, Matthias. Um, um, uh, Dave Strand is going to be um, um, uh, heading off to uh, to take care of some business uh, early afternoon, and uh, uh, our MITRE colleague Bob Avgen will take over as the uh, the steward of the chat area. So you'll see a changing of the guard there. Hopefully, uh, won't see any any uh, significant change in performance of the czar of the chat room. <laughs> okay, great. So why don't we hand it over to Steve Dar then to get us kicked off with uh, the first session. Sounds good, Matthias. Steve, uh, let me get your slides uh, up and running. In the meantime, the mic is yours. Great. Well, I wanted to um, just take a little bit of time before we dive into the session to uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. So um, <clears throat> today we're uh, we're going to look at emerging standards and certification challenges for novel weather observations. That's uh, a long way of saying we've got a lot of opportunity with new technology and um, and there are some risks associated with it. And we want to uh, begin to um, explore that state of the art and uh, and state of the practice and um, uh, from the perspective of, of different uh, emerging uh, technologies and provide an opportunity for the community uh, to discuss the potential of those technologies and their utility um, uh, and, and to talk about the uh, possible pitfalls associated with it. So uh, we've got uh, <clears throat> uh, representatives from a number of different communities uh, on the panels today. Uh, the first panel is going to be um, yeah, talking about the Alaska um, or the, the FAA's Aviation Weather Camera Program, which is uh, emerging from Alaska, uh, so Alaska and elsewhere. And that'll be uh, spoken about by the uh, program manager, Walter Combs. Um, that'll be followed by a discussion on uh, ADSB weather, uh, specifically uh, looking at the data distribution planning for uh, its receipt and distribution on the ground. And I'll be joined by Bob Maxson, the director of the Aviation Weather Center, uh, to discuss that. <clears throat> uh, then we'll take a break and we'll come back. And um, uh, Don Birchoff will uh, uh, lead a panel <clears throat> that talks about low level operations, uh, weather needs. Uh, and that's going to focus primarily on UAS. Uh, Kind of operations, but uh, but also should be interesting to uh, anybody who flies, uh, you know, in the part of the atmosphere that has the most weather uh, and the most localized weather. Uh, and that'll be that'll focus on uh, the weather needs. So hopefully the uh, uh, providers and the regulators uh, in the uh, audience are able to uh, contribute to that discussion as well. Uh, and then we'll follow that up with. Um, a discussion of technologies that are emerging for uh, supporting those kinds of operations. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to do <clears throat> just to sort of get us practicing uh, uh, injecting and, and whatnot and, and being part of the discussion is to uh, get everybody uh, to hover down by the little raise your hand button on the controls for the Teams meeting and uh, and take a little uh, real-time poll here <clears throat> and I want to see who 
in the audience, uh, who's the, who of those folks that have joined us today are um, on the operator or weather user side of things. So go ahead and click that uh, raise hand button if if you're part of that and you can just leave your hand raised. Um, I can see people are starting to click in here. Um, so we've got about a dozen or so folks who identify as uh, as an operator or a user of weather, uh, numbers are still going up a bit, so people are starting to find their their controls. That's good. So maybe we got 15. Um, then uh, add yourself to that raised hand group if you're uh, a, a weather producer or provider of uh, weather data to those operators. And so the numbers are climbing here. That's great. We got about another 10 or so we've identified there. And then if you're on the uh, if you're on the regulator or policymaker uh, side of things, go ahead and, and raise your hand there. All right, well, I'm seeing that covers about half the audience. Uh, so if uh, if you aren't one of those groups, clearly I've not identified a major proportion of our audience. So go ahead and uh, list in the chat window. Uh, there's still an opportunity to raise your hand here, but uh, go ahead and list in the chat window what what part of the community you're you're uh, you're joining us from, because I'd be interested in knowing who we're reaching that I wasn't expecting to. And in about uh, in about 10 seconds or so, we'll ask you to put your hand down if you raised it so that uh, as we go into the uh, going to the presentations, we don't uh, think that there's a lot of people who are um, who are interested in in interjecting and and uh, okay, so I'm seeing r and d sensor providers, more r and d. All right, I hadn't really separated that from the uh, from the side of, of producers or providers, but um, I guess I should. And so um, I will endeavor to be a little more sensitive to that going forward. Um, and I'm seeing that uh, not all of the folks in what I might have thought of as the regulator side or operator side of things are uh, are seeing themselves in either area from a <clears throat> from an FAA uh, perspective, the uh, Center Weather Service Unit folks or air traffic control folks. So uh, that's great. I would have I would have thought of of uh, of you folks as being part of the operator uh, side of things, but we can we can be specific on that as well. So. Uh, so that's terrific. Um, as I mentioned, the first thing we're going to talk about is um, is the Alaska Weather Cam uh, program and its emergence beyond Alaska. Uh, we're sort of going from most mature to least mature in today's uh, session. So um, I'm going to ask uh, <clears throat> Walter Combs to uh, to unmute and and maybe uh, maybe go on video so uh, people can see your your expressions as you're giving us the information, but uh, also Matt to bring up uh, Walter's charts and and we'll get started. OK, great. Can you hear me and see my rugged good looks? Um, we well, can. Walter, we can we can hear you. <laughs> the rugged good looks will have to wait, Walter. <laughs> we can see you, Walter. It's good. <laughs> OK, well, thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. So yeah, I'm the weather camera program manager. Uh, I've been with the program for since 2008, so 2007 rather. And uh, so I've, I, I was here for the, the de initial develop, development and uh, implementation of the system and operations. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? One thing I do want to 
mention is that weather cameras has been brought from the PMO over into flight service. I think I mentioned that at the last time I briefed the FPA here, but uh, it's important that uh, we understand that because flight service has really helped uh, helped us to expand and expound uh, with our service and and so I'm quite pleased with with our new home and I just like to uh, uh, convey that to everybody. So uh, weather camera program we've got we have 230 FAA owned and maintained camera systems in Alaska uh, in Canada. We've we've uh, we integrate their images. They've got camera systems across their country. We integrate those onto our website and make them available to our pilots who fly uh, between uh, Alaska and the, and the lower 48 states. And we are a national program, so we've started expanding our services into the lower 48 and into Hawaii as well. So as you can see, we've got 13 camera systems that the state of Colorado owns. We help them with uh, the technology and and they installed the systems and maintain them and we integrate their images onto our website just like we have been uh, with nav canada and montana just stood up a new camera system uh, as you can see they're on the website and um, they're looking at installing a few more we're we're in uh, we will help colorado install 10 more 10 new additional systems so there'll be a total of 23 and in Colorado here this summer, so starting in May. And then, of course, in Hawaii, we've just completed the engineering. I'll show you some of that information here later, but uh, we're planning to install 26 systems in Hawaii. And we're we're reaching out to other state DOTs. If uh, the state DOTs want to uh, establish weather camera systems uh, in their locations, we will help them with technology and, and uh, subject matter expert type of activities and we will also integrate their images onto the website and make them available just like we do everybody else so we're offering that service intentionally to expand weather camera services across the country where we don't have otherwise the funding to do so so it's working great uh, it's a it's a great partnership with the dot's and uh, we're looking forward to a lot more of this. So anybody that uh, that might be listening in here today that has uh, uh, access or, or has uh, uh, an interest in this subject, let me know. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so our new website is really kind of a, it's really a data portal. We have uh, a myriad of different information now available to pilots for for self briefing uh, and and situational awareness and flight planning. Uh, we have uh, of course the camera images, but we have airports and charts and supplements. We've got radar um, uh, under the those airport icons. You can get uh, a. a, a all of the information uh, charts and and uh, other information for the airport itself. We have PIREPS. Uh, there's a number of different base maps you can select from if you like it. Radar, satellite imagery, overlays on on the site, and uh, 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 other information. You know, we're we're actually building this thing out, so we're continually expanding this system. Uh, for for our users out there, so it's it's weathercams.faa.gov. That's the the new uh, URL, and I think we'll be showing that to you here in just a moment. So that's the new website, the legacy website. We have a pop up. You guys will see that when you go to the legacy site. That's telling you, hey, please go to the new site. We're going to be sunsetting the legacy site in January of 22. Can we move on, please? So the way the weather cameras are used, uh, most of you have seen this slide or seen something like this slide, but they're used in a route based kind of scenario where you can see the camera images at, at specific locations. They're strategically placed these locations to provide weather information along a route uh, from your, uh, you know, from from uh, your launch site to your destination. So in this in this depiction Anchorage to to Cordova and all the weather that resides along that route. So 
Uh, it's very valuable, you know, uh, in this use scenario and understanding the way these camera systems are used, uh, especially in light of the establishment of camera services. So where we put them, uh, where we install them and, and where the cameras are aimed all have to do with identifying weather and providing information along a route as much as possible. That's how we handle that. Can we move on, please? Of course, our system is modular. It's uh, it's small. It's robust. It's it's made for Arctic type uh, operations. Or I mean, it it, it can actually it's uh, uh, operate in all of the Alaska environment as well as as the the lesser uh, uh, environments with with regard to severity. So uh, it uh, being modular, we've got. Uh, camera module we can plug in as many cameras up to four as we want actually five if we want to put a fifth camera on we do have that capacity we have a camera control unit that provides all of our connectivity it's kind of the, the brains of the of the remote site where we, we have remote monitoring remote control and all the processing to pull that data and push it to the cloud and of course we have a, a weather sensor on all of our sites uh, we're expanding that weather sensor to include ceiling visibility and pressure. So we have we have the other elements, but but those three elements we don't have on this weather head. So we are building a new system that provides those elements. It's called a VWAS Visual Weather Observation System, and I'll speak to that later on uh, today in in the uh, in this meeting. So then we have IP telecommunications that push our data to the cloud and then the data is disseminated from the cloud to our remote monitor, or excuse me, our operations control center over to an API where different users can use the data. We're working right now uh, with a test user uh, on this new API so that uh, we can push that data to them and, and, and verify and validate the, the service itself. And then we're just going to open it up to the to public users. So all those people that have apps and and uh, and other uh, products that where they need to use our camera images and and our weather data, they can access it to include National Weather Service and, and flight service itself. And then, of course, we push all of our data to the website as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> this is just a quick example of the different locations and the different uh, ideas and abilities we have to establish camera services. Pretty much if we can find infrastructure, we can figure out a way to install it. Basically, you need space, power, and communications to, to support a camera system. Space, a place to hang the cameras. Power, you gotta you gotta power it up and in com. You gotta figure out how to ship that data back to the cloud. So that's what we've done, and here's a bunch of different ideas that we've used. Hey, if we don't have space, power, and com, we we build our own up there in the left hand corner. You can see we have a solar wind powered system, a battery plant with a plant manager, and then we've got our our our. Uh, uh, telecommunications and our cameras sitting on the platform. So we build our own if we can't if we can't find some that's available and we know we need to put uh, to establish a camera service in that area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> sometimes I, I like to say sometimes we get real fancy and uh, here's a here's a few examples of of getting fancy where uh, there's no infrastructure at all and we've had to figure out how to establish our own in some pretty uh, pretty rough terrain actually, rough conditions. So um, we're pretty proud of it. It's a good solid system and, and we're happy to uh, to have it and happy to share the technology we're using there. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, OK, questions and, and answers. So we'll start with answers if anybody's got those and questions follow that. Uh, Walter. <laughs> uh, Dave Strand here. A couple of uh, questions came in. Uh, Robert Whitworth was having trouble making it load on Internet Explorer. Bob Abgen <laughs> responded correctly that sometimes there's company and organization proxies <laughs> configurations, but is there any uh, browser type restrictions? Uh, I know some things don't play well with Explorer. Yeah, no, there's no restrictions, but uh, with Explorer, depending on the, uh, the uh, version that you're using, uh, 
uh, it, Ex Explorer makes it awful hard to access our site. So we actually have a pop up. You, you should see it that says, please use a Chrome or Edge or other browser. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, Internet Explorer does not support the technology that that uh, that we have to use for this system and and many other systems. So uh, if you're using the newest version of Explorer, you should have access to it, but most people don't have that. Okay, so there you. is a there is a there is a notification letting people know uh, that, that that does pop up. Alrighty, and uh, Gordon Brooks asked uh, if it was possible if you could elaborate on what you mean by PIREPs are available and ask to elaborate on that. Oh, sure. Um, when you so there's a left hand menu on the website and you can enable that and it will show geographically positioned uh, it, the geographically positioned PIREPs. So uh, when somebody submits a PIREP, it goes through the system for national distribution and we pick that up and we display it on a website. So you can actually go there and and open those up and, and see the, the PIREPs uh, in the area that you're interested in. Uh, Walter, this is Matt, and I know this is going to be live TV, but would you like me to bring up the uh, the, the website on, on on my system here and, and talk me through bringing up a PIREP? Uh, sure, sure, yeah, if you'd like to do that, yeah. And while right. uh, while Matt's accessing that, um, the uh, we've got Ralph, only a first name, Ralph the guest. Um, interesting question, are the cameras a legal determination of VFR that UAS could fly on beyond line of sight? Uh, that is a question for flight standards, but I yeah. can tell you that I do know um, that uh, right now, the, the BV loss uh, subject is being uh, uh, considered and and developed for um, you know for for guidance and and regulation. I don't know that there's been any kind of a uh, a rule put in place now to support BV loss or uh, beyond visual line of sight. So, but flight standards would be best to answer that question to give you a lot more details. Do we uh, have do we have anybody from flight standards on or formerly from flight standards who, who would who would like to take a, a swing at that? Well, uh, Matt, this is Gordy. So uh, it's a million dollar question, right? Um, <clears throat> but I can tell you that uh, you know for VFR operations in Alaska. Uh, these cameras provide tremendous ability to uh, see and avoid, the ability to determine if you can see and avoid, right? Uh, and have had a tremendous impact on the safety of operations, 85% reduction, I think is roughly the number in, in CFIT accidents since they've been, uh, since its inception. Now, beyond visual line of sight, I mean, that's, that's, that is, that's the challenge, right? And that's what this this group hopefully can get into. It's another data point uh, in my mind. It's another data point. Um, and, you know, from a certified weather, I think some of you have seen in the past, and it was justification for us to move into this VWAS system, which Walter briefly discussed. Uh, you know, only 3% of the NAS has certified weather information. So that leaves a the, the great... <laughs> The great beyond there um, to, to make that that determination. So it, it's it's highly dependent, I guess, on uh, the area of operation. Um, you know, as far as uh, in valleys or you know near water, things like that, or mountainous areas where you know you couldn't extrapolate that. Um, you know, with with the use of uh, the GFA or the Hems tool or other other <laughs> products. To, to kind of make that uh, route determination. Um, so, I mean, obviously we know there's a there's a tremendous need um, and we don't have this, uh, these areas adequately sampled with uh, certified weather, but uh, you know, to operate VFR, it's, um, you know, you just have to remain clear of the clouds and, <coughs> and uh, have a sufficient visibility. So it's, it's, it's tough oh. question, Ralph, I, 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 I'm, I'm dancing around it but you know the fact of the matter is it's 
you know, why not use it? Because it's another da uh, very good solid data point. And with the uh, VIA um, product that, that is being released on this, it'll automatically determine visibility. So, but I think Matt's got the site up here, so we can kind of. No, work. actually, actually, Matt, Matt flunked. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it's it's good to have a, a wonderful team that you're part of. Uh, Bob Abgen has it up, and he has shared his screen for us. <laughs> hey, hey, Walter, I I just found one uh, UA uh, down here in uh, Anchorage area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a beautiful it's, day. Yeah, yeah I brought it up. Day. So uh, mm -hmm. if you want to so, walk through, I'll, I'll click whatever you want me to. To do here, you got so um, so basically the the UA that you brought up the the pyrep you brought up we're using ICAO iconography, uh, iconography as much as possible. Um, I wish that um, well I'll tell you what, um, boy I wish I had control of that thing. Um, hang on one moment I want to look at something on my side here real quick. I don't see something on yours that's got me. So to the left over there in that left hand menu, can you move yeah. your mouse over there and show sure. them the pie reps? So there's the pie rep yeah, uh, there it is. icon and you can turn it on and off and the, the pie reps pop up. Of course, it's uh, a beautiful day in Anchorage right now. And uh, so uh, so we don't have a lot of pie reps, but boy, I tell you what, when we have a windy day, it, uh, it you know, we can have a uh, uh, a, a lot of pyre ups around Anchorage, you know, with, with with the pilots coming into the terminal area. So, if you will go up and 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 uh, close the pyre up pop up that you've got there, sure. You know, the little X there, down at the bottom in that r right hand corner, there's a there's a a, a legend. Go open that up. So um, you can see there the pyre up uh, iconography that we use. And at a glance, you can tell where, uh, you know, what that pie rep is. And when you open it up, you know, some of them are UUAs, uh, some, you know, some are, uh, uh, you know, VFR. So they're color coded for, for flight category. And so um, if you will reach up there to, to the, the cameras and the, and the METARs and TAFs and turn those on. Sure. Up here to the left. Mm hmm guitars and the taps yeah, apps and go up to the cameras and turn those on too oh, yeah okay now go back down and open up that legend i just want you to show that it's an interactive legend okay. now you see the expansion uh, of the legend itself so all the the items that you've got in the menu opened um, when you go to that legend if you don't understand one of those uh, icons that's how you can chase those out and determine what's what but that for the METAR, you see the 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 flight categories for VFR and MVFR, etc. Uh, uh, that that's the that's the color coded and the other explanations. So, uh, you know, for for all the different iconography on the on the web page. But I don't know. Uh, is anybody having bad weather somewhere? Let's if you wanted to drag over to the East Coast, you could see examples maybe of more. Uh, of more pie reps that are on the website, but um, not sure. You have to zoom in, yeah, to get the. There we go. Yeah, you see all those squares. Yeah, yeah. and the wing so one. Go ahead and open up one of those, and go over and find one of those marginals and and stuff. So there you are. There's the. So, so we give the pie rep in the in the coded format and in the decoded or the plain text format as well. So you don't have to. I I always have to sit there and kind of study the thing. You you know even as yeah. much as I use it, but uh, I like to decode it. I just got lazy and I just go to it now. But uh, look at all those pie reps. Do one more thing. Over to the left. Go over and you can see near about the turn on the TFRs. Go. You see the TFRs? They're down about the fifth one from the bottom. Oh, uh, the the terminal area. Nope. I saw it. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Turn that on. Okay. So if you will zoom in on one of those. I got okay. a notice on one. That's good. Okay. Now go ahead and click on it. Okay. So there you are. There's your TFRs. Yeah. So 
if you play around on this, you can see a myriad of different information that's available to you. And then, of course, there's underneath that TFR button there to the left, you can see all the different uh, yeah. sectionals that are available to you, uh, you know, if you if you want them. So anyway, that's the website and you guys are welcome to go play around on it and and get to know it and learn it. Uh, we're getting hordes of great feedback. A lot of pilots really like it, and we're getting some very good uh, uh, constructive feedback that's really helping us with with the development, uh, the further development of the website. So we're quite happy with it, and uh, the numbers, the number of users is growing constantly. So as we start expanding camera services across the CONUS, uh, I, I expect this to 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 become a, a you know a, a much more heavily used website. But right now we're getting about three hundred thousand hits a week, so that tells you we're we're getting some pretty good usage now on this website, and a lot of you know uh, eventually you'll see cameras cameras spread all across the country. I I hope. So that's uh, it. I'll and stop here and then. And uh, Stephen, uh, I'm not sure how we are on time. We got a couple more questions that have come up. Do we have time, or do you need to? Uh, yes, uh, we do. In fact, we've got uh, up until the top of the hour. So um, okay. Um, in that case, we've got uh, Robert Whitworth. Um, let me see the whole string here. The is there any utility for a large provider such as Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, to install these systems at? Uh, Metro airports like um, LaGuardia, New York, JFK, Teterboro, and White Plains. Uh, yes, is the answer to that. I'll, I, I can tell you that uh, the camera services aren't just something that, I, that I'm pushing. They're, they're uh, desired by a number of different organizations. And, and I want to take the opportunity to say that um, the, the state DOTs and, and the municipalities uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the cities and, uh, you know, the governmental type organizations, I think are, are the ideal owners or the ideal uh, sponsors of camera services to help expand uh, aviation safety and efficiency in their areas. And a lot of the DOTs are starting to recognize that and reaching out to us in this partnership. Uh, you know, there's so many different entities out there, DOTs and municipalities, that they can't all just develop their own website and push data out. Although there, a lot of them are doing that, and I'll get to more directly to your question, but I wanted to set the stage here to say that uh, this website compiles all of that information onto one website, so it's available to everybody. And that's our that's our partnership. That's our side of the partnership. There's a lot of work to that network, and and developing and processing those images for distribution nationally and that kind of stuff. So we we have a pretty good workload in our partnership with the DOTs and municipalities and others uh, to bring those images in where they own and operate the camera. They generate the data and then we take it from there kind of a concept. Um, there are users out there right now that really can use these camera services that, that we install. Uh, the, the helicopter, you know, one of the issues is Helicopter air ambulance, for instance, uh, really can use this weather information. If we can get entities to sponsor those cameras and partner with us to distribute them nationally like we do. Um, there's also uh, the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee's uh, Safety Enhancement uh, 12, SE 12 they call it. And what, what that essentially is asking for is to take the myriad of different camera systems out there and all try to pull them all into one website, which is what we're doing. So um, so there's a, 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 a and then of course there's the the safety um, side of the FAA as well as congressional interest in expanding the camera system. So so any municipality or 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 airport uh, manager that wants to put cameras on we're here to help them in that partnership. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we know, uh, you know, basically we can help uh, from, you know, provide SME type of support and technical support to help 
these entities get up and operating and then it's just a matter of we grab their images and put them on the website. So uh, hopefully that's a, a thorough answer to the question that you did you ask. Yep, and that it looks like uh, he had a follow up that that uh, answered uh, as well there about uh, the primary design of the uh, for which users. So uh, that sounds like it's pretty much all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, couple of questions on visibility, but there's one here before we get too long from the display uh, comment. Nice pirate display. Is there a way to display one hazard? In other words, like isolate turbulence only or icing only on the pirate uh, display? Well, what we do is we grab the display and put it at, at, we, we basically pull it from the ad server, the National Weather Service ad server. Uh, it goes through a server called Wimsker. Uh, and then goes out for national distribution from there. Uh, we pick it up off the ad server to display it on our website. And uh, so however that thing is formatted, then um, that's that's what it displays. So if you look at that legend again, you can see that uh, the output of that would say, uh, hold on a second, I wanna make sure that I've got that brought up. Do, do you want Bob to pull that back up uh, again? Actually, uh, and, and sorry, Dave and, and, and Walter, this is Matt. Shame on me for not saying to Walter, Walter, do you want to share your screen? Do you have enough bandwidth to do that? And if so, you're welcome to. Yeah, I, I do have enough bandwidth, and, and we've got a few more minutes to the top of the hour, so I, I will do that. Yes, please. I, I don't know why. Uh, I, I guess it's still too early in the morning for me and not enough coffee. Perfect. <laughs> and, and you think it's not earlier for Walter, huh? Well, he's used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it. I, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Uh, you know, that's one of the benefits of living in Alaska is you get to get up real early for some of the meetings, but, uh, but I, I don't complain about that at all. And so, that's what I meant by being used to it, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I do want to point out that uh, you can see that each one of these uh, Pyreps have um, the, the IKO iconography. So you're seeing here, can you see my mouse moving around here? This? Yes. Okay, so this section here uh, is, is, is turbulence, Pyrep turbulence. So if somebody submits a Pyrep that is just turbulence, uh, it, it will pop up with this type of an icon right here. You see it right here? So there you go, there's your turbulence. Uh, so, so turbulence is the uh, it, it basically the essence of that of that pyrep, and then uh, there will be icing pyreps. So those are the other category. I don't see any icing in this area right now, and, but, and, and, uh, but these are the icing uh, pyreps here. And, and Walter, I think what the question uh, and it's from Gordon Brooks was really about is, is there a way to filter so you just see turbulence pyreps or just see icing pyreps? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I didn't get that. No, we don't have a filter for you know to to provide that kind of um, uh, you know function. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. So I wasn't aware that that we would be looking for only. Uh, you know, for just one type of a pyrep, I, I wasn't thinking of that, and, and that's not something that we've considered in our development. But it's something I'll take back to the table. It's a great question. I'll take it back. Oh, here's yeah. one for for uh, for icing. I, I I'm I'm thinking, uh, and, and I'm not a pilot, so therefore, uh, you know, take what, whatever I say with a huge grain of salt, but. You know, if if I was if I was planning a trip and I wanted to see, you know, how much turbulence there was, and then I wanted to see where the icing was, and maybe I wanted to see if there was, you know, some uh, uh, convection or something like that, I, I might want to filter each one and look at it from the perspective of the of the weather constraint, mm -hmm. uh, just that singular one. But, mm -hmm. And I'm not a pilot; I'm a dispatcher, so uh, right. yeah. And we provide we provide the information. You know, it's geographically placed and 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 it's uh, uh, graphical uh, is the concept here. So, you know, you can just look at them and see the difference 
between the two, but to have a, you know, to have a way to segregate between the two, I have, we haven't considered that, and uh, I will take that back and and uh, see what, see how we might be able to provide that kind of function. Um, there's a question on: Are the camera feeds available via an API? Say that again. It says, are the camera feeds available via API? Uh, the new API will be available uh, in June. Right now, we're we're testing that. Uh, we do have a user agreement that uh, entities will sign uh, with regard to, uh, you know, uh, behaviors and and uh, access to the data and that nature of thing. So that's in legal right now, and I'm waiting for uh, the final approval on that. So then that's what the process would be uh, to sign that document and then have access to the information. But it'll be a free and flowing access directly uh, for a download of, of camera images uh, in June. Uh, and there's two or three on visibility here. So let me, I think it's probably best, let me read them all three and then you can just speak generally to the uh, visibility questions. One uh, from uh, Matthew Morris was, are there any plans to expand the uh, VEIA, the uh, algorithm for visibility estimates, to new weather cameras in the CONUS in Hawaii? And then there was a, another question, do you have algorithms that give visibility in the cameras from Ralph Stauffer? And then uh, Mike Matthews responded to the first one, visibility estimating through image analytics, which is the VEIA. Is the algorithm to estimate visibility from cameras developed at Lincoln Labs? It's an evaluation mode running in all weather cams, maintained sites, and will include CONUS and Hawaii. So th there was that uh, exchange on visibility. Anything that you want to add uh, to what Mike had responded, which looks like he pretty much answered that or um, or expand on the visibility? Yeah, that's that's uh, that is, that is the status right now. We have 240 camera sites that have uh, via uh, operating on now, and uh, the testing and analysis of that data is going real well. Um, <clears throat> we had a we had a third party type of uh, assessment come in and take a look at it, and we found some problem areas that we're working on right now. But we're quite encouraged with via. And we think it's going to become, um, I, I envision it to be a, a prominent feature on the weather camera program, uh, all of our camera images and, and the service that we provide. There's, um, there's a lot of more benefits to that, to that capability or to that algorithm and, and the use of it uh, that uh, are operational. So they really help me maintain the website, or excuse me, the camera sites themselves uh, as a notification and remote monitoring type of uh, uh, a procedure that we can use it on, as well as uh, visibility outputs. And And we're hoping for, uh, we're hoping to develop the ceiling uh, estimates more so, so that we can kind of get a, a uh, an adequate level of trust in in that output as well. So, uh, via is it, it's it's going to be you know it, it's still in its development and it's still growing right now, but it's going to be a very uh, valuable uh, asset in at least in the weather camera program and uh, and uh, and of course uh, aviation safety and efficiency. So. Okay. As you can as you can tell, I like Via. I I, I think it's going to be great. <laughs> well, that sounds great. Uh, uh, by what I can see, I think I have captured everyone's comments or questions. So unless any are going to pop up here, the uh, uh, Dave, screen, Dave, you want to take it back. A, I'm sorry, Dave. There's a question from Rob Banks about any plans to exploit AI or ML algorithms on the camera data to provide additional information or or use it to validate numerical weather prediction models. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure. I think we. Um, so what the the algorithm does is it extrapolates visibility and and. Uh, 
uh, hopefully ceiling here in the future uh, estimates for, for distance. So is that the question? That That's what that algorithm does. Uh, Rob Banks, you want to just uh, verbalize your question um, to Walter? Yeah, sure, Walter. So <clears throat> I was thinking more about um, I mean, we know that the models are really not handling convection and thunderstorms very well, especially in areas where we don't have much radar. And could these cameras be used to identify, you know, say cumulus, uh, nimbus clouds, those type of things to help improve the models um, in areas where we're identifying a thunderstorm, but it's not actually there? Uh, Yes, in fact, I see that uh, Dave Kochevar is on, and, and I think Dave can answer some of those questions. I know National Weather Service is a huge user of weather cameras, uh, weather camera images to assist in the development of forecasts and now casts. Uh, Dave, I hate to call you out here, but if you if you want to jump in and, and uh, add to that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, sure. Thanks, Walter. Um, so we have we have had some discussions in particular with the via project and um you know once we're through the evaluation we're <clears throat> we're certainly interested in bringing that information um into our models and, and and especially into the verification of our models um good good quality visibility data is is really hard to come by so um yeah that that's certainly just a discussion that we're already having and we're looking into and um you know looking in the years down the road i i, I certainly envision being able to utilize this via data um you know the the next steps beyond that you know walter mentioned mentioned the possibility of, of potentially drawing some ceiling information that has been utilized in the past and the, the quality hasn't hasn't quite been as good as visibility so far. Um, I'm not aware of any projects that do that that really do anything as far as cloud type from these um, from these webcams. But in general, we're we've been we, we, we tend to fill in the gap where there's poor radar coverage utilizing the satellite and the polar orbiting satellite data instead. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, th I think it's something that you know, machine learning seems to be the the big topic with these webcams right now. Um, and so I, I think the jury is maybe still out as far as how that might be utilized in the future. Um, you know, as far as what what the true capability really might be from that. There, there's a lot of folks interested in it that have have, have reached out to me. I don't know about you, Walter. Um, but that, that definitely seems like, you know, maybe another emerging source of these is, is, is really harnessing AI as much as we can. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I know that there's a number of different organizations that are working, uh, that we feed camera images to, and they are working to develop more AI processes uh, to learn the environment around the camera system as well as to uh, extract or, or to uh, identify additional information so kind of that you know the, the the camera service is just really burgeoning right now it's just starting to come out and 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 people are finding all different ways to try to use those info that information to benefit uh, especially in the weather service uh, or in the weather uh, uh, communities. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that isn't being worked right now, specifically to identify uh, different kind of cloud formulation or uh, formations. But um, but I don't know of any particular right now. And uh, Walter, uh, Randy Bass has his hand up. So Randy, do you have a Follow-on question to that or a different question? No, I got some follow-on comments to that. Um, right. You know, the the natural progression is uh, uh, specifically from VIA was, you know, visibility. Then, okay, can you see clouds and, and cloud decks? And and I think the, the follow-on from that would be the identification of particular cloud structures and, and, and types. So I, I, it's not something that we're looking at uh, right this minute, but I, it is something that uh, 
um, I think we would have uh, plans for uh, uh, down the road. Uh, as Mike Split uh, points out in the uh, in the chat, uh, Florida Tech is already looking at uh, some of those things um, on their side and incorporating AI into uh, uh, cloud observations and things. Um, and then another area that uh, the uh, the WIDIC program is looking at, you know, working with the uh, uh, Helios folks at uh, um, Harris, is uh, deriving wind information from the uh, from the camera images. Um, you know, we've done some work looking at uh, the wind socks there on the, uh, at uh, some of the smaller airports that were co-located with uh, ASOS, and found that. Uh, you can actually do very well looking at the uh, uh, both the direction and wind speed uh, just looking at those wind socks and and using AI to uh, to come up with a uh, wind speed. Obviously, it doesn't work over 16 knots because that's as high as a wind sock will go. Um, but there's you know there's been talk about potentially extrapolating that to you know even looking at uh, other structures you know flags or trees or something like that to uh, to derive wind information so it's uh, as walter points out it's it's still really a, a new technology um, as far as uh, you know, deriving weather information from these images. So uh, um, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but it's, uh, um, you know, I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, just to top, Randy, uh, Mike Split's work is under the um, WIDIC program, under Pegasus, the stuff they're doing with the cloud tops. We also have Rockwell looking at, and I was going to ask Walter if he's had any users ask for this. One of the things we kind of thought that we don't see a lot with the camera network and i was curious if he's had pilots ask for it is being able especially if we get the winds to do short-term forecasts to sort of let you know how how much longer you think that condition you're seeing on the camera will stay unchanged so right now it basically gives you a picture of what it is now but you don't necessarily know whether it's going to change and with getting all the different cameras and wind speeds you might have some idea or be able to create sort of a short term forecast to say you better check back, you know, in 30 minutes or an hour, we see something coming. And I didn't know if that's been something pilots have been asking for as we do winds and cloud structures. We may be able to produce a pretty accurate, you know, validity time. How long is the current state? Do we think it's going to be there before you better check back and assume what you looked at in the camera is still current? Has that come up at all? That that that. In in essence, it really has, and that's kind of uh, that. That's one of the questions that uh, does uh, uh, you know arise once in a while is why ten minute refresh? You know why why not five minute refresh, refresh or twenty minute refresh uh, on the camera images? And it has it has everything to do with the changing weather and and you know uh, over time, how fast is the weather going to change in this location? Over what given a time, so that that kind of uh, that that interests me, and and it's something that I think that if we could uh, kind of develop that and and get a good look at it, I I, I think it might be something of value. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's something Rockwell's kind of wanted to expand, especially if we can do the winds that Randy was talking about. You know, if you have basic wind <laughs> information. You have the ceiling types, the, ha the cloud top heights we've been looking at, and the visibility numbers to do what kind of a very short term forecast. You could probably, at least Rockwell believes, they could produce something, you know, that's not, not like days out, but, you know, an hour or two um, mm -hmm. that could be pretty accurate. Yeah, and that's, well, that's where we're, we're most. You know, an hour or two is is huge, right? I mean, if we can predict that weather over over a two hour time frame, uh, yeah, for the you know, short flights, it would help huge. a lot. That's huge. Yeah, that's huge in in several different industries. If you look at it, uh, industry by industry, uh, one thirty five air taxi, helicopter air tour, uh, helicopter uh, uh, air ambulance those industries could really use that kind of information. That'd be very valuable. So yeah, I'd like to, when we have our next Starlink, we, and Rockwell's now going to be on, and so is Mike Matthews from MIT on our Starlink monthly calls. We can talk about that on our next one that we've got. Yeah, that's great. I like it.
Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, everybody. It's uh, great to have all the participation. Uh, Walter, terrific uh, uh, lead in to the discussion and, and um, great to see um, the website uh, in real time and, and showing uh, the Ohio Valley uh, all the way from Alaska. That's, uh, <laughs> it's impressive what you've done. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, lots of other stuff um, that people have thoughts on, but um, we're a bit out of time right now. Uh, if we have more later in the day, maybe we can return to it. But um, we want to move on uh, to uh, talking about ADSB weather and um, hopefully engaging the, uh, the community in a similar fashion on, uh, on the data distribution planning. So um, I'm going to ask people to um, find that little raise your hand button again. Go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, keep it up for about 30 seconds or so, uh, maybe a minute so that everybody can find the button and, and, uh, and press it. If you've uh, seen ADSB weather uh, information in FBA previously or, or have a general idea of what ADSB weather is, um, then <clears throat> I'm guessing that we've got a lot of non newcomers and that I'll be able to save a little bit of time going through the presentation based on how many of the hundred or so people we've got on the line indicate some some level of familiarity. <coughs> Steve, uh, j just a, a comment. Uh, Matthias and I were, were uh, after yesterday's meeting, exploring um, a situation in which he does not have a hand raising capability. So these numbers may be under reports or under counts, depending on what sort of operating system you're running, et cetera. OK, great. <clears throat> um, I do see that we're, we're hitting about the 50 percent mark. Um, and and so I'm I'm going to provide enough to um, let people engage with us um, with Bob and I. Uh, and if if there's a need to provide some clarification or um, or additional information, you know, please use the chat window uh, to uh, type in a comment or a question. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but one of the things that we want to do is <clears throat> is talk about where we are. Um, and if you go to the next chart, I think I've actually got a purpose chart here that, that uh, says what it is we want to try to accomplish here. So we'll give a, a real quick update on the ADSB weather development status and then use this unique gathering to uh, to try to gather some input on the data distribution con ops uh, and, and planning. So essentially think of a, a concept of operations or, or this uh, this planning activity as focusing on you know what we currently have in, in an as is kind of uh, way um, identifying what um, what we want to have on the opposite side of that chain the 2b and then getting at what needs to change to to get from where we are to where we want to go uh, and we're going to try to um, talk a little bit about you know where we are uh, where we want to go and why and then have a more um, uh, inclusive discussion on on the, uh, the way to get there. So if you go to the next chart, uh, this gives you just a, a quick overview on ADSB weather. And, and um, so for that 50% of folks that that uh, raised their hand, uh, some of this should look familiar, but essentially we've been working over the last few years to uh, develop standards in the form of minimum operational performance standards through RTCA and you're OK. Um, that will be referenced in uh, avionics regulations uh, in the form of a technical standards order and then um, in the form of, of uh, aircraft regulations uh, that will allow equipment built to the technical standards order to be installed in aircraft. Um, and then on the operating regulation side, um, uh, we're, you know, the, the federal aviation regulations or FARs uh, identify uh, what must be done. And, um, and you can see in the upper right, uh, the, the sort of yellow shaded box, that the, the ADSB weather concept provides for 
basically two things, an air report or air rep that's a fully automated high rate uh, periodic broadcast of uh, sensed or computed uh, information that's weather related, uh, that's on board the aircraft and that can be uh, can be fully automated in terms of taking the information that's, that's resident there and, and sending it out to people that can use it. And that's for both air to air and air to ground use. And then the second area is pilot reports or PIREPs where <clears throat> pilot would have an application, maybe on an electronic flight bag or integrated into an avionics interface uh, that would allow them to uh, submit pilot observed weather information via the ADSB data link. And so that's why it's called ADSB weather because the air rep fully automated um, uh, broadcasts go out over the ADSB data link and, and the PIREP sort of on condition, the pilot pushes, a, you know, does some data entry, pushes a button, and then off goes the PIREP. So, um, so we've got those two capabilities and we now have a MOPS that's published and it's uh, specified for the ADSB version three, that um, that ADSB weather, these two capabilities are part of that version three MOPS, and that's in the lower left. So, the way in which that's specified is as an optional capability, and that <coughs> um, leaves operators free to choose whether to equip with that um, capability in their avionics, and and even which uh, inputs to connect. So, if they want. Uh, to send temperature but not wind or wind but not weight or uh, other things you know they can they can control that when they install the, the box in their aircraft and connect up the, the various uh, parameters <coughs> uh, and then on the uh, on the side of of uh, you know the current rule we have and uh, and where ADSB is going. This this is a version three standard. The rule is based on a version two standard. Uh, and while the rule will be modified to allow version three avionics to satisfy the rule, uh, there's no anticipation that uh, that version three will be a required version. There's no retirement of version two planned. No mandating of version three planned, and no mandating of weather uh, within that. Uh, within that. So uh, when you get to the lower right, you see you know, between what uh, the upper uh, right and the lower left provide, um, we anticipate that ADSB weather uh, will be enabled on the basis of these uh, new standards, uh, new regulations, and the interests of the operators in, in, uh, <clears throat> in providing that weather in order to gain the benefits. So that's ADSB weather in a in a nutshell, uh, the next chart gets into where we are and sort of why um, why we want ADSB weather. So, on the air rep side of things, uh, ATC procedures uh, <clears throat> performance currently is limited by a lack of real time weather information, uh, and that is um, manifests itself in that controllers. Will apply buffers and will do sort of, um, uh, you know, they're, they're continuously adjusting headings and airspeeds to try to achieve the uh, desired spacing and, and maintain the required uh, separation uh, without knowledge of, of how those um, aircraft, you know, are operating within the uh, within the airspace so they they try a speed and if the airplane's still going too fast they slow them down a little further if they try a speed and the airplane ends up going too slow they speed them up but with real-time weather information uh, those sorts of things could be much more um, much more readily uh, identified as to what speed uh, you know the aircraft should be flying or what heading it should be on in order to uh, to not you know, creep in toward the airport or away from the airport or away from the, the desired track. And so <clears throat> those uh, things we have today, you know, those those uh, test and adjust kind of procedures limit the operating efficiencies of the of the not just the aircraft, but the airspace system. Uh, and then in terms of uh, wake separation and trajectory based procedures, 
all of those are currently uh, designed to be conservative because the optimization, uh, the data that's needed to optimize those things uh, is really real-time weather. And, uh, and without it, you need to make assumptions about how bad things can be and, and whether or not you're going to uh, encounter those. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, uh, so, so you end up putting in essentially what the controllers put in, these buffers that say, you know, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know what I'm going to encounter, what the aircraft are going to encounter. And so in order to ensure that I don't put myself in a, in a loss of separation um, or loss of spacing kind of uh, situation, I'm going to be conservative with my, uh, with my procedures. And then on the weather forecast side, um, we've seen over the years in this forum and in others that uh, the weather forecast models, numerical weather prediction models, their performance is really highly dependent on aircraft-based observations. And so uh, we know that when they get more observations, they do better. And, uh, and so we want to get more observations to those models. Um, on the PIREP side of things, we have uh, a submission and dissemination system that's manual. Um, and it ends up with uh, delays and errors and, and loss of data and um, has been uh, implicated in a number of, of aircraft accidents um, over the years, uh, not as not as uh, direct causes, but as contributing uh, contributing uh, causes. And, and so uh, we want to try to move from this as is <clears throat> to a um, to a future which addresses uh, some of these things, and and that looks like uh, what you see here in the in the two B area. So, when we get this real time in situ uh, set of aircraft based observations, then uh, we would want to make the data available to the air traffic control uh, decision support tools, the air traffic management decision support tools. I was happy to see folks from CWSU's on today. Um, so. Um, uh, so we know you guys would benefit from this sort of thing. Um, you know, Bob Maxson is joining me as the director of the Aviation Weather Center uh, because he sees the, the tremendous benefit that this uh, this provides for uh, not just aviation weather, but weather forecast models in general. Um, <clears throat> we know that there are folks from the uh, Aircraft Operations Centers. Matt has mentioned that he's uh, he was a, a dispatcher and, and we've got other dispatchers on. Uh, those aircraft operations centers are going to want to see this information. We know that there are air-to-air -air applications. We're not here to talk about those today, but um, uh, but some of the uh, procedures that um, that are flight deck based uh, depend on these uh, these data, and um, and then looking at at having these data long term to do things like climate studies and climatology. And we heard yesterday. Um, some of the uh, the questions about um, uh, working with uh, what what operations are available during different times of the year based on some of these uh, these expect expected uh, weather situations <clears throat> and um, and if we have this data then we then we you know enrich in the archive and and maybe give ourselves a uh, a greater opportunity to um, look at that. Um, and so uh, on the PIREP side of things, uh, what we want is to address those challenges that um, that if people want to look at the NTSB report for a couple from a couple of years ago on uh, submission and dissemination and error, uh, error entry and data loss, um, you know, we think there's an opportunity to um, to incorporate into the application the pilot uses for data entry to do error checking. Uh, we know that once we get the uh, the message out onto the uh, on you know into the ether um, off the off the aircraft via data link that uh, when it hits the ground it can immediately uh, be uh, considered submitted and and it can be automatically uh, uh, processed and so that. Uh, immediate and automated processing can incorporate uh, a lot more error checking than the airborne uh, portion of it can. So the data processing on the ground can look at things like uh, reasonability and uh, and 
and things that go beyond simple uh, range checking and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and then do uh, PIREP encoding that would allow the uh, delays that are associated with um, <clears throat> with the uh, with the current PIREP processing to uh, uh, be mitigated and uh, and turn those things around immediately in an automated fashion to the existing PIREP uh, distribution networks, including back up to other aircraft in the area. So. Uh, we think the round trip time from uh, the pilot doing a data entry to getting a, a pyre up on the FISB uh, network could be uh, on the order of of minutes, maybe less. Uh, certainly, well below the current uh, current turnaround time for um, a pilot using voice to tell a controller what he's experiencing, and the controller handing that to a back office processor, and and that working its way to the top of the stack, and then. Uh, and then going back out via those distribution networks. So, <clears throat> so we think that the the impacts of of air reps uh, will be more accurate, more precise, and potentially more frequent forecasts. There's obviously work that needs to be done there. Um, these things won't produce themselves more frequently without changes to their uh, to their operational uh, tempos. But uh, we also think that it provides more rapid, more accurate weather awareness. That will allow for improved avoidance of of uh, hazardous weather um, through that weather awareness that, uh, as I mentioned, with the air traffic control procedures, um, the uh, the aircraft operations can be uh, become more efficient and that we can do things like uh, enable tools to improve avoidance of hazardous wake turbulence and, and, and the wake turbulence program at the FAA really deserves a lot of credit for pushing over the last 10 years to uh, to bring this uh, to the point where we have it today. Um, it really carried the ball here and and um, <clears throat> and and we're looking forward to you know seeing it through to uh, deal not just with the air side, which is where the, the standards are, but on the ground side, which is what we want to talk about today. So uh, we think on the PIREP side, we'll get uh, more PIREPs with fewer errors. Uh, that uh, that this uh, will take the air traffic control and flight service station folks out of the loop uh, for those PIREPs that, that get submitted via ADSB. They'd still be involved in uh, submission and encoding of, of manually um, submitted PIREPs, but this data link opportunity allows for full automation of that process. <coughs> uh, we already have a dissemination network for PIREPs, and, and we would tap into that with the with the ADSB PIREPs and and then at the Aviation Weather Center and other places where uh, having that uh, human observed weather information uh, to influence forecasting and other uh, products like uh, uh, AirMets and SIGMets uh, would have uh, would have a similar um, impact. So uh, some of those uh, air wrap impacts with uh, avoidance of hazardous weather, et cetera, um, can be uh, also generated by PIREPs. <clears throat> so if we go to the next chart, <clears throat> now we get into that middle area. So what changes are needed to get from the, the as is to the 2B and, and have those impacts that we just uh, saw? On the left hand side, you see what's done or what's planned or pending. Um, and uh, on the ADSB weather side of things within ADSB version 3, those messages are defined. So any future airplane that is equipped with a version three uh, ADSB out capability that has the um, uh, the air rep or the pi rep uh, capacity will uh, be able to send those messages, and we expect those to be available uh, within the next couple of years. We know that there are avionics manufacturers working on them right now. They're waiting on the TSO. We expect that to come out within uh, this calendar year. Uh, we the rule change to allow version three avionics to be used to uh, comply with the ADSB rule is already in process. Uh, it's uh, being submitted as a direct to final uh, sort of thing, which uh, should speed that process if it's if it's uh, promulgated that way. Um, and the FAA is already planning to upgrade the ground receiver network for ADSB to receive and decode uh, all the new message types, including the, the weather messages. 
Uh, but what we need to talk about today, what we're here to talk about today, <clears throat> and what's needed is what you see on the right. And that's essentially to scope and specify the ground-based delivery of this data. So we want to know which data in what form goes where, uh, when, in terms of uh, is it a continuous or an unconditioned sort of thing, and, and what's the best way to do it? How should we do it? So what communications channels should be used? What, what communications protocols should be used? Those sorts of things. So just a, a refresher um, in terms of, uh, you know, how do we achieve the 2B? Some of the folks here, um, I think the next couple of charts uh, deal with, you know, what's coming um, and, um, and where we are in terms of, of uh, that planning. So uh, the top graphic you see here <clears throat> is clearest on the left and a little sort of cloudy on the right. It's uh, designed that way because uh, what we have in terms of a basic concept of operations says, we get the air, the information off the aircraft through these message broadcasts. We get it to the ground through receipt of those messages, and then we get it out to the users by, through a data delivery mechanism. Uh, the thing that's that's clearest right now is the stuff on the left. So we have the um, fully specified messages. We know, for instance, that you know what messages we're going to receive, and that the ground network um, will be. Uh, We'll be able to receive the messages. What we uh, what we need to do is work um, with the on the ground receipt side to talk about you know how do we uh, extract the data, how do we correlate the data, what sort of pre-processing should be done as part of the reception to uh, to then uh, do data delivery. And the data delivery is the is the cloudiest or the least defined on the right. So. We, we, you know, we want to get the data to the users. Uh, we want to get it into a repository, but things like what uses, what specific uses are being uh, supported need to be considered. So the wake turbulence decision support tools, you know, need that data in real time, whereas things like climatology can work from, you know, uh, you know archives from, from long ago. Um, <clears throat> and we want to, Try to use the uh, the participants here to uh, to tease out some of these conops elements. So if you go to the next chart, um, I think I've mentioned most of these supported application examples. I'm not going to brief this uh, in detail um, <clears throat> or even really at all, except to say that you know air traffic control and management is a is a user of this information. The wake turbulence uh, folks, both avoidance and uh, and wake surfing. Um, uh, in a flight deck uh, uh, environment can use this information. And on the weather forecasting sorts of things, we've talked about um, the, the uh, opportunity for weather forecasting. But that's the three sort of areas in which we've, we've pushed for this uh, capacity and on which um, we're you know, moving this forward. You go to the next chart. Uh, <clears throat> I've mentioned that the you know, the broadcast is fully specified, so I won't rebrief this. If you go to the next chart, uh, <clears throat> here are the uh, the air rep parameters, and you can see that there's uh, sort of the basic things that determine weather uh, or that weather uh, manifests as. So we have icing status, we have winds, we have air temperature, and and we have uh, things like uh, eddy dissipation rate. Uh, and then we have some other information that's needed to uh, support some of the specific applications we've talked about, like the uh, the wake turbulence um, applications where gross weight and wingspan and airspeed are important. Um, <clears throat> and then we support some other things uh, like uh, you know, air to air uh, aircraft recognition by including things like aircraft type. Um, and we we have some further term uh, elements in there. Like the aircraft configuration that um, uh, that the noise uh, people at airports are interested in because of the um, the interaction of flaps and landing gear with with aircraft noise and and the wake community is interested in in seeing what uh, what sort of um, optimization they can achieve if they're aware of of things like uh, like flap <coughs> flap deployment and and uh, lift distribution on the wings from a span wise perspective, but uh, hitting the big the weather things like water vapor and and um, 
and getting into some of the uh, the hazardous uh, conditions like icing um, are all supported by these messages. And they come out from a weather perspective really quickly from a from a position surveillance perspective, not so quickly, but um, but every couple of seconds, you're going to get either a weather state message or an alternate weather state message, depending on whether or not you have good wind information. And then every five seconds, you're going to get uh, one of these uh, aircraft state messages in the right column and, uh, and an emergency priority status message that carries the EDR and the, and the water vapor with it. Um, and altogether, um, this amounts to uh, a few bytes over the course of a minute. Um, uh, you've got somewhere on the order of, uh, of 40 to 50 messages coming out. Um, and and the total uh, number of bytes coming out is is you know below 300 uh, in terms of data. <clears throat> and so over the course of a year, uh, while this likely seems like a whole bunch of data to um, to the weather community, and it should because it's much more frequent than than anything else out there today. Um, 3,000 aircraft operating 24/7 um, over the course of a year will will generate less than a gig and a half worth of data using these uh, parameters. We really uh, brought the um, brought the, uh, the bit counts low and um, <clears throat> and but we we haven't made the data not useful in doing so. So all of this, all these parameters were, were well coordinated with the weather community, with the with the operator community. And so we have the range and resolution that's needed, um, you know, from those communities, um, it's been coordinated all the way up through WMO on uh, on the details of this, and um, <clears throat> but you know we're not going to flood the planet, um, uh, flood the the data centers with uh, with data. It really does not amount to a lot of data over the course of a year uh, for a pretty significant number of equipped aircraft. So, go to the next chart. Uh, we see the PIREP parameters, and you see this is data, um, not a PIREP itself. Uh, so if you think of a PIREP, an encoded PIREP is information, well, then this is the data that underlies it. And so there are about uh, 33 parameters here that allow uh, everything that is uh, encodable in a current uh, PIREP to be transmitted off the aircraft except for free text. Um, and the data link simply doesn't have the the capacity to do text messaging over it. So, um, but we do, we capture some interesting things here. You can actually submit a, a awake and counter report via PIREP using this, uh, this construct. Uh, you can submit up to three different types of weather that are observed, up to three different layers uh, that are observed. And, um, <clears throat> and things like uh, uh, low level wind shear, uh, runway condition, uh, reports, um, all those sorts of, uh, all those things that are currently submittable um, via voice will be submittable via the ADSB um, uh, PIREP capability. Go to the next chart. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, where we are with message receipt, and here's where it gets a little, you know, less uh, specific. So we know the the messages that are going to come out, we know the, the ground receiver network will receive those messages and we know that we need to, um, because it's multiple messages with different data in different messages, we need, we know that we need to correlate those messages together and do that data extraction and, and then correlate that data together so that we get a good, um, a good picture of what's being reported by a given aircraft at a given uh, place in time. And so, uh, so we need to specify that ground receiver network data processing. If you go to the next chart, uh, we have some ideas on how to do that. So there are other things that are in the ADSB uh, message set, uh, particularly in their in their uh, position reporting, um, that will allow us to um, to tell where the aircraft that's reporting was when it reported. So every uh, ADSB message, uh, whether it's weather or other, uh, includes an ICAO 24-bit address. And so we can uh, correlate uh, the weather parameters uh, with other uh, 
other messages like the position. So to find out where in three dimensions the air rep data was, we intend to correlate with the latitude and longitude and altitude that's reported with the um, uh, ADSB position messages. Um, none of the ADSB messages actually include time. Um, all of the ADSB system relies on the fact that that uh, these uh, messages travel at the speed of light, um, and so we can stamp the time of receipt on them and assume that uh, because of the limited uh, distance over which they can be received, that that there was really wasn't much progress made in terms of position or time between when the message was sent and when it was received. Uh, <clears throat> that receiver function uh, is uh, is to be specified, so uh, we can stamp it with a full uh, GPS time, or we can stamp a relative time on it when it's received air to air. It's it's uh, uh, received and stamped within a 512 second epoch that that you know an application on board the airplane probably doesn't ever deal with anything beyond 512 seconds so when those epochs turn over it's pretty easy to to you know continue to rely on relative time but a more absolute time uh, a longer time scale that might be needed uh, the application would would uh, supply that if it's on board on the ground we have the opportunity to say you know, we want full date, day, time, month, year, epoch, whatever. Um, we also have uh, uh, under version three, uh, we'll have constant uh, opportunity to assign a GNSS altitude to it, something that version two doesn't, doesn't currently allow for. <clears throat> um, so we think we know how to correlate, but then um, we need to, to uh, be able to say, what do we forward? And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and this is on the air rep side, on the pi rep side. We also have um, <clears throat> some ideas as how we of how we turn a set of message data into an encoded pi rep. And you see the elements of a an encoded pi rep in the left three columns and where we think the message, uh, uh, the, the, the ADSB weather pi rep message uh, source for that information is. So a couple of things we don't send at all. We don't send uh, where we are um, and we don't uh, <clears throat> we don't actually send the actual time in terms of a coordinated use universal time in that pirate message. We send a relative time from the time the, the send button was hit back to when uh, the pilot says I observed this um, you know a minute or two ago um, and um, and so we will tra trace back on the ground with the data processing to say two minutes ago that airplane was here in terms of altitude, um, location, and you know lat long. We'll process the um, the information in the uh, report to or in the messages to determine whether the report is a, a routine or an urgent PIREP once encoded, and then identify that station identifier uh, based on where we found the airplane to be when the Pilot said, "This is what I. Um, this is you know what I observed so long ago, um, and that uh, that time that the pilot can assign is up to 30 minutes. So we think that you know there'll be plenty of time for the pilot to deal with whatever the weather is presenting them in terms of um, getting out of icing or or getting away from turbulence, and then say, you know, I don't want my buddy that's following me to come back, uh, come into this area." And um, and so I'm going to submit this pi rep so that they can get that information in a timely fashion. So um, <clears throat> the uh, the next chart uh, gets into um, where we want the audience to start engaging. And I apologize for you know uh, as much time as as was it was used, but I felt like we really needed to set the stage. So I'm going to ask Bob to jump in here. Um, and and this chart and the next chart. Uh, or the next couple of charts work on this middle portion and the rightmost portion uh, of the of the basic con ops. And to, to talk about from you know from the aviation weather center's perspective, you've seen all the information that's coming down uh, or coming out of the airplane. Uh, you know what sort of extent of data processing would you want to see on receipt versus do you want all the raw data 
at the Aviation Weather Center and you do that data processing? Would you want to do the correlation of of messages, you know, air rep messages with position, or do you want that to be done ahead of time and some sort of message delivered to you which says this airplane delivered this data from this location at this time? And and then, you know, what data, and this is for everybody to be thinking about, and, you know, get it into the chat or get your hand up, um, but, you know, what data regarding that observing aircraft is necessary to interpret the data, to perform QC on the data, that sort of thing? Yeah, thanks, Steve. I uh, really appreciate this presentation, all the hard work that you've done uh, to make this happen. I, I, I think folks can see the clarity and the uh, brilliance of the, of the work that you've accomplished in the concise information that you're bringing down uh, over the period of a year. Um, not that much data, but a tremendous amount of information. So, you know, we'd be looking for for the raw data, but we do need the, the position and the time uh, probably inherently merged, you know, before receipt. Um, it's, it's just tremendous opportunity for us to actually see the atmosphere as it as it is. Uh, and, you know, I, I got invited into this project through, uh, through uh, the need to have better and more uh, uh, accurate PIREPs uh, with a lower latency. But the really, really attractive thing to me beyond the PIREPs are the air rep uh, information that is uh, continuous and, and very comprehensive. So, uh, you know, we'll have to look at how, how the data is QC'd. Uh, and so, um, you know, we want to make sure it, it, it is good data before we enter it into the system. But uh, the skill that it will uh, give a forecaster and the confidence of, uh, you know, I've, I've got this situation in this area uh, and not over here uh, is, is very powerful. Great. And I saw, uh, thank you, Bob. Um, I saw a couple of hands go up and then down. I'm seeing some uh, stuff in the chat. Um, uh, regarding uh, questions about latency, and, and maybe I wasn't clear enough, the uh, the ground system would stamp this data on on uh, with with time on receipt. The question is, you know, how how long a timestamp do you want? Do you want it, uh, and how precise do you want it? Do you want it down to a tenth of a second, or a uh, you know a thousandth of a second, or even uh, below that? The the air to air receipt um, works in the microsecond. Uh, uh, re arena, but uh, we probably don't need that for weather data. Um, but you know, on the air to air side, they don't need the fact that it's you know Tuesday the or Wednesday the 28th of April. Um, so, um, but on the ground side, when we're archiving the data, we probably want to know that that was you know Wednesday the 28th of April at 12:37, um, you know, Eastern time maybe down to the second, uh, or maybe that's, maybe the minute is good enough, but these are the things that we want to start to tease out. Um, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, as you put stuff into the chat, um, you know, ideas into the chat, you know, we'll get that chat log at the end and I'm going to kind of get that from the organizers and, and try to organize the, uh, the input. So please, you know, put your ideas into the chat. If you want to, if you want to speak, um, raise your hand and we'll, We'll call on you. Um, I think the next chart, uh, Matt, brings us to um, the next portion of the uh, the conops that we need to to really develop. So those questions that we talked about before, um, you know, to whom, how fast, you know, with what reason, with what redundancy, um, you know, how resilient should this be? You know, we don't. We don't want to specify a brittle system that only has one data delivery point. Um, so, um, thinking about um, how many um, uh, how many delivery points we should use, um, and um, and what uh, you know what resilience that provides. Uh, I already talked about how much data. Again, you know, three thousand airplanes operating twenty four seven, sending out uh, the air rep message. Uh, uh, those, those three air up messages continuously amounts to less than a gig a half a gig and a half of data in the course of a year. I think we all have enough uh, free space on our our thumb drives if if, uh, if not on something more reliable than that to uh, to store up that data. So this is really 
uh, I think an opportunity. Uh, uh, again, you know, I'd ask Bob to to address some of these questions uh, from the perspective of the um, of the Aviation Weather Center. Uh, but Matt, if you go to the next chart, you know, we've already got some ideas uh, or some options that uh, we think might help generate some discussion around this. So, uh, so Asterix is a uh, format that came out of Europe that's used for uh, for transferring uh, position surveillance data, data from radars. Uh, it's used uh, globally, and and they're in the process of of updating the Asterix uh, standard to uh, account for uh, version three messages from ADSB, and um, and we'll be working with them to see whether or not there should be an Asterix weather surveillance message. Uh, there's also been discussion uh, in the U.S. and in ICAO about SWIM and uh, putting the weather messages or, or the weather information on on SWIM in a weather um, format. But you know, there are some decision support tools that likely have specific formats um, that uh, and specific communications that need to be met. But you know what from a uh, airlines ops center and a weather service provider format and communication channels would be best. So, um, Bob, uh, I take a break or take a breath, and you you jump in, and then hopefully some of the folks, the dispatchers, uh, the uh, the weather providers that raised their hand earlier can can jump in with uh, their ideas as well. Thank you, Steve. I, I have the advantage of having a number of conversations uh, with with Steve, and we thought about these things in kind of broad brush terms and. You know, there's a, there's a delivery cadence that would be useful, uh, I think, for the Aviation Weather Center. Uh, and it may depend on aircraft type, aircraft altitude, aircraft speed, uh, and, and what density uh, of, uh, of data you're trying to collect. Uh, you know, I, I really was impressed with Walter's presentation. And, uh, you know, the need for more observations in areas like Alaska, this could really, really be uh, beneficial. So, uh, you know, this is a, a long, long away from uh, of being a fully baked cake, and uh, we're just starting now to socialize. Uh, I think the importance of, of these data within the weather service. Uh, so we're working on it from that front. But you know, as as we look at it, it really would benefit from having uh, external uh, input, as, as Steve mentioned, from the operational communities and the, even uh, the, you know the data dis distribution uh, services that are out there. So this is. Uh, this is really a great, great time to get in on the ground floor. And so, uh, you know, with that, I, I would, I would hope we get some input from uh, our colleagues uh, within uh, FPA. Great, thanks, um, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. And and we've got um, a little bit of time left. Uh, I've been. Trying to watch the chat. Uh, there's been questions about uh, UAT. Rocky, thanks for answering that. Uh, the process, in fact, I'll be uh, meeting tomorrow with the UAT group. Uh, 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 but we're making uh, real good progress on implementing these same capabilities on the UAT side of things. Uh, the uh, I saw the question about volcanic ash. Uh, it is not one of the parameters that we have. The, this, um, uh, it would be a useful parameter um, uh, at present. The um, the ability to to get at the specificity that's uh, shown in the comment is just not present on most airplanes, um, and so um, so we didn't dedicate the uh, the limited bandwidth we we had opportunity to use to that. Um, the um, uh, the question of mandates uh, uh, for the uh, for the uh, data or or providing um, providing incentives is uh, is one that's uh, open. Um, I see uh, Walter Rogers, you've got your hand up. Maybe you want to uh, speak to that one a bit. Wait a second. Hold on a second. Oh, there we go, Walter Rogers. Microsoft finally got around to unmuting me. Thank you. Um, 
this is such a, an incredible wealth of data with the, the avalanche of ADSB out uh, occurring. I'm a glider pilot and XCWSU MIC have been involved in air traffic control, weather aviation support for 30 years. I retired about 10 years ago. Um, even my sport aviation aircraft, the glider, um, I even have ADSB out in that. Now, gliders are not mandated to acquire this at all. Yet we're being good citizens, some of us, many of us, to uh, provide this service. But similarly, there may be GA pilots, business, and even commercial air carriers that might want to provide this data. And some kind of incentives, I think, would be valuable to this, even possibly dollar incentives, although I know that's a sensitive issue with government agencies and so forth. So I just wanted to get that point out. Great, thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> the two first name conundrum. Um, yeah, so um, there is uh, there is talk about uh, at least to being able to uh, to ensure that the end-to-end uh, -end system works. Uh, about the FAA providing some opportunity. For to uh, to avionics manufacturers to ensure that um, uh, that some of their non-recurring engineering costs associated with these new um, with these new capabilities is is covered um, uh, in order you know that the FAA will have the ability to ensure the ground system is working and that's <clears throat> that's something that's uh, that's underway um, not just for um, the weather side of things but uh, but also for things like uh, the monitor function that is uh, um, looking at um, it's new in version three and looks at uh, the um, uh, the congestion on the on the on the uh, frequencies. So um, we are up against the uh, the break time now. Um, I'm still seeing stuff coming in on the chat. That's great. Uh, as I said, we'll uh, we'll get that. Uh, after the meeting and, and be able to go through and, and uh, pull out some of these um, uh, these questions. Uh, Jim Hazeman's uh, comment about more PIREPs uh, coming through as a result of, of ADSB and, e and even being able to do things like filter on the altitude uh, uh, when you're displaying that PIREP information um, would be good, something like, uh, like ways for traffic. Uh, and that's really where we think this can be good. Um, Matt, if you'll go to the next chart, I want to make sure that this sits up uh, for a minute or so so that everybody has an opportunity to get the information down. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we're really uh, just getting going in this, this uh, area here. Um, I liken it to the chicken and the egg problem. For years, we had people telling us that there was no way we'd get on the ADSB link, um, that uh, that it would take you know um, too long to uh, to implement this capability that we'd be leapfrogged by other technologies. But the fact is that that uh, we're here. Um, uh, we've got, you know, we now have the egg um, and it's time to incubate it and and, uh, and get ourselves a chicken. Um, or <laughs> if you're more um, if you're more interested in the in the breakfast analogy to, to you know, break the egg and make an omelet. Um, but uh, but we've got the opportunity. We need the help. Um, we want you to help us help you. Uh, by getting involved. So you've got our contact information here. You've got a good sense of, of where we are, where we want to go. Um, and, and I think it's in all of our interests to get there. So, uh, but we, we need your voice, we need your assistance, and, um, and we want to make sure that we do the best job we can in getting there because this is such a rare opportunity. Um, you know, ADSB gets revised about once every decade. Um, and we just got into the standard and, and we're looking forward to uh, getting into the ether and uh, and we want your help in getting to the ground. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bob. Very nice, full of information, also important. And and yes, I, I second or third or fourth, you know, the help us help you by getting involved. Of course, one of the interesting questions that goes along with that is, OK, how, how do we get exactly involved? And, and I, I hope I can use that as a teaser 
to uh, to invite everybody tomorrow to stay to the very tail end of FPA, where we'll be talking about maybe some FPA organizational constructs that 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 could support a a tiger team or a working group or a rutabaga or whatever we would call it that that could be stood up and 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 actually be the place where or the or the the body that 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 could help bring this entire audience together and provide you the input that you're looking uh, for uh yes steve should have an aerospace in his email as opposed to airspace good catch um keith Barr, and i will change that here shortly so it's uh it's uh, 11 until um steve your session do you want to go 15 minutes till four after or do you want to be even more of a taskmaster than you already are and say come back at once i think we take the full 15 minutes um and uh and i'll thank tom ryan in advance for that uh that leeway <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, then we'll make it five past one. Everybody come back. Um, I will fix Steve's email. I'll leave it up here a little bit longer, and then uh, then we'll have you on the break screen. So break it is. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, let me get rid of my time for a break and the, the Earth map. And let me go. Oh, that's not going to work. Hang on. I know why. That's, I learned that yesterday. Come on, baby. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to do it like that. All right. Bear with me one sec. Bearing. Bearing. Okay. And where are you? There you are. Let's. How are we doing? Gary, send me your bio again, and Justin, sure. I, I'm trying to pull them together. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it soon. I'm done here. It should be pretty quick. Are we, are we ready to go? Uh, I, I well, I certainly am. Can can uh, uh, can you see my slides or your slides, Gary? They look yes. good to me. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, welcome back, folks. Um, um, Steve, Steve Dar, do you want me to uh, to to describe these next two sessions, or do you want to you want to let us know what we're expecting? Um, well, for the, for anybody that's newly signed on, we're going to be talking about um, uh, the low-level operations weather needs uh, for uh, primarily for UAS and, and other low-level operators. Uh, that's going to be led by uh, Don Birchoff, who's um, CEO of True Weather Solutions, uh, that works in this area and uh, and within ground transport and logistics as well from a weather perspective. He's a retired Air Force Colonel with uh, lots of experience in this area, um, <clears throat> militarily and uh, working with the uh, uh, Next Gen Weather uh, ConOps um, and uh, with the National Weather Service uh, Science and Technology Director as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to let him introduce the panelists for this session, and then he'll be uh, joining a, a panel uh, after this uh, that's going to be led by Justin Hilliard, who um, <clears throat> is going to have folks talking about uh, Technology for remote observations panel. Uh, technology for remote observations, and that's uh, going to focus primarily in this low-level operations area. <clears throat> and uh, Justin's with UPS Flight Forward. Uh, he'd previously been with UPS Airlines for um, for 15 years, um, but he's uh, he's really led the effort to um, <clears throat> uh, as chief meteorologist and, and operations support officer within the. Uh, Within the UPS Flight Forward to make uh, Flight Forward the first fully certified Part 135 cargo drone airline, and that happened um, 18 months ago, so uh, almost to the day. Uh, so he's uh, uh, he's going to lead that second panel, and um, and I'll let him introduce the panelists uh, when the time comes for that. 
very good, Steve. Thank you. So, Don, over to you. Panel number one, two, three, whatever number we are. Ready? Set, well, go. well, thanks, thanks, everyone. I'm I'm really uh, excited about the two panels we have today. I really just want to. I also want to say that in listening to the program so far, I'm very impressed. You know, really pleased and impressed at the innovation that um, we're starting to see uh, within this group and uh, pushing the envelope on some areas uh, to try to, you know, some break some paradigms and try to be more innovative about how we approach weather, weather data collection, closing gaps in our, in our, in the air, in the airspace and even on the ground that we have to close uh, to get better at what we do. So, um, you know, I thought Walter's presentation was, was outstanding today. I really take my hat off to Walter because I know him working, uh, you know, in, in the FAA, in the system, System, what he's accomplished, I, I know, is, is, is very impressive. And, um, and so uh, just wanted to say that, that, that the progress has been, is really is great. And we have a lot more work to do, of course, but, um, but we're coming together, I think, as an industry around thinking about these micro weather challenges, um, understanding, you know, again, that our work won't be done until we can really effectively support drone operations safely and reliably and efficiently and you know it's going to take us many years to do that but we've got to keep chopping away at it and we've also got to build you know standards that are going to allow us to to help serve the industry and make them successful around it so anyway that's so going into this i you know we wanted to first introduce uh, a couple of folks here that are actually operators you know i consider them operators because they're working within companies that are in the field trying to solve problems uh, around weather and in drone operations and where the rubber meets the road. Um, you know, they get the tough questions every day from people who are trying to fly these missions and trying to understand how, you know, why is it I can't do this or that, or how am I gonna do this or that? And, and you know, they're, they're in the trenches explaining, well, you know, we have limited data sets and, you know, we're working on this or that. And, um, and I think they got some good insights to share today uh, with everybody to get, you know, just get some of that ground level uh, view. So the first one is going to be uh, Gary Graff. Gary is uh, the operations manager at True Weather Solutions. He's been basically working with the New Air Alliance uh, for almost two years at the test range in New York. Been part of the UPP2 uh, as a weather as as a weather. Um, you know, intelligence provider and helping them manage risk, testing new capabilities. Uh, Vaisala loaned uh, Gary a, uh, a wind profiler that we had out there during UPP2, which really gave us some valuable information that he's going to share with you on his presentation. Gary is, um, he's also, uh, he was 12 years active duty in the Air Force, uh, supported Army operations, helicopter operations, um, and then now is a uh, is a guardsman for uh, the, the unit up at Syracuse, which flies the Reaper, and so he he actually practices uh, what he preaches day to day with the guard when he's uh, on duty. Ch the challenges that the Reaper have in uh, flying and uh, in weather, and and then he works for True Weather uh, uh, full time when he's not doing his guard work. He's also uh, completing his master's degree. He has his uh, bachelor's degree in meteorology, and he's working on his master's degree in emergency management at Millersville University. So, um, you know, really, uh, really good ops background, day-to-day -day working the, the problems and, and he's gonna uh, present today. The second uh, person we have is, uh, is gonna be uh, Justin Hillard. Justin is uh, at UPS. Um, he has over 15 years working at the UPS airline. He recently joined the UPS flight forward team Formerly, he was a flight control meteorologist supporting flight dispatchers. He now has a split role as a chief meteorologist in operations support. Justin is a certified part U, uh, 107 UAS crew, uh, part UAS crew member. Is that, I think you're missing something there, Justin. We, it's part 107, I'm assuming. Uh, I'm not sure. And helped yeah, 135. Write, oh, 135. Sorry about that. And helped write the exemption that's allowed the uh, U UPS flight forward to be the first fully certified part 135 cargo drone airline in September of 2019. So he's, he's had to go through those wickets uh, to help, um, you know, 
the, the certificate holder uh, to get the approvals to uh, to do some flying. And there's still uh, a lot of work to be done in part 135, especially as it comes to uh, some of the rules we have uh, for the pilot having knowledge of which the weather they're flying in, which is really difficult when you're not on the airplane, but he'll get into that. And then we also are really privileged to have Jeff Massey. Uh, Jeff's a senior research scientist at Amazon Prime. And he's responsible for designing and building the operational weather service that determines whether or not it's safe for a drone to deliver packages to a customer's yard. Prior to joining Prime Air uh, in 2019, he designed and built weather-based uh, uh, data science models to improve Amazon's transportation and fulfillment activities. Before Amazon, he was at the Climate Corporation. He was a weather team lead. And um, I think everyone pretty much knows what they were doing there uh, with agriculture. He holds a PhD in atmospheric science from Utah, University of Utah, and a bachelor's from Cornell. So uh, we got a really great panel. We're going to get started. So let's, uh, Gary, it's off to you. All right. Thanks for that introduction. I, I sound awfully busy, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Gary Grafe, Operations Manager with True Weather Solutions, and we're going to kind of set the scene here. Uh, with some of the things I've been seeing in the field, uh, working with our partners and and others, mostly up here in the New York uh, UAS test range uh, with New Air. Um, you go ahead and write in the next slide, please. So one of the things we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about, is some some stuff I saw um, with flyers and the issues they get into with weather, um, how how they look for it and how they use it, and then later we're going to hear some solutions. So here's an example. Um, we had a flight, uh, it was a pretty big flight. It was a demonstration of flying a COVID test kit over Syracuse, about seven blocks from the rooftop of a hospital uh, to uh, another hospital location. Um, and because of this real lightweight uh, kit that was hanging below it, the thresholds for this drone were about 12 knots. Uh, so we look at the forecast for the following day, the media was invited, it was gonna be a big deal. Uh, we at True Other Solutions had suggested they move it back couple hours because uh, we're a little bit worried about some winds aloft maybe reaching that threshold so they did they moved it called all the media had them reschedule a little bit earlier uh, we got there uh, click next slide please all right so in the day of this is the TAF that came out this TAF came out at 7 a.m uh, this was in February I believe uh, January, actually. January has come out 7 a.m. So according to this TAF from Syracuse Airport, which was within five miles of the location, we had five knots all the way until 3 p.m. So you would say, man, clearly it's go weather. Um, yep, go ahead. Next slide. So we got there, 9.30, took off without a hitch. They actually had a windsock on the building. The windsock was showing six knots at the time of takeoff. It was successful. And next slide. Turns out at 11.30, which is the time they originally had slated, uh, Syracuse Airport recorded gust to 16 knots. And of course, this is at 10 meters, 30 feet off the floor with the, with the ASOS. And this flight was taking place at about 300 feet. Um, so, you know, TAF's you know, adequate for manned aviation for sure, but because of the low thresholds, a lot of these UAS, um, you know, uh, aircraft, uh, you know, are using, especially when you add some payloads to them, uh, you need a little bit more granularity. Now, I had a video there that was showing this thing take off. It was really awesome. Uh, looks like it's not going to play for us. I uh, apologize for that. Next slide. All right, so another example for UPP2, which Don talked about. Uh, it was the demonstration that uh, New Air was running uh, with a bunch of uh, USS providers. Uh, they were testing a lot of remote ID type of things with a congested airspace. I believe they maxed out at 17 drones in the air at the same time in a, in a small area. And we, we managed to uh, work with one of our partners, Vaisla, and a company at, uh, with, that's associated with them called Leosphere uh, to get this wind cube, uh, which is a wind LIDAR. Uh, it goes up to about 400 meters uh, above ground. And I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, 200 meters above ground, I think it's 200 meters above ground. And you set that up out on, on uh, the airfield out of Griffiths, and you're able to measure winds in, in nearly real time. Um, and what we found was that uh, the, the winds that pilots believe they're dealing with aloft often isn't the truth. 
And one of the reasons why is, is um, you know, there's a TAF right at Griffiths Airport. So they use the TAF using the METARs like they're supposed to do. And, you know, again, the winds at the surface don't quite tell the story aloft. Uh, sometimes they use a handheld anemometer standing at six feet and, you know, they're getting wind gusts, you know, winds at five to ten knots or whatever. And when they fly, they're getting winds sometimes three times that. So we used the LIDAR and during one of the testing phases, they had this, um, they put a small puck, they called it. It was uh, a little device that was used for the remote ID uh, thing. And it added very little weight, but it kind of messed with the aircraft's handling somewhat. So they had assumed that because they were having issues controlling the aircraft, that the wind speeds were around the thresholds for the aircraft, which for uh, those were about 22 knots or so. But And without the LIDAR, we would have known any different. Uh, the LIDAR showed, however, that the winds were about five knots to eight knots less than what uh, they thought they were. Um, and so what happens is, you know, that the pilot uh, is unable to relate the issues that they're having with their aircraft with what the actual wind speeds are locked. Next slide. And I wanted to bring up space for a little bit because we don't talk about uh, space too much. Um, you know, and one of the things I hear a lot about is the navigation issues that some have have uh, dealt with as far as flying the aircraft. And I was looking into this and I see a lot of the commercially available um, weather applications or software or websites that are, are geared more toward UAS. Uh, use the KP index. And this seems to be very common across the board, but I also found that there's a lot of discrepancy between what is the threshold um, to, to be able to fly. Is it a KP index of three to four, five to six? Some have said it has to be at the extreme end of the chart to have any effect at all. I spoke to another pilot who, who flies for New Air about KP index that he never heard of it. Uh, he said he actually uses RAIM, and RAIM is uh, a piece of technology that's used to assess the integrity of GPS. And so the point here is, um, you know, when it comes to space weather and navigation, uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a common uh, parameter or uh, process to use in order to uh, determine whether you should or should not fly based on this, this aspect. Next slide. And then comes this question, does it even matter? I'm standing with a uh, representative of a company who, whose operation was literally just rescheduled due to weather. And they did the mission. After the mission, I, I was talking to him and I introduced myself, told him what I do and what our company is doing. And he says, well, I don't think weather is going to be an issue. Drones are, drones are going to be weatherproof. But, um, you know, good luck with what you're doing out there. And... You know, I couldn't believe it that right here, you know, they had a mission that was literally just rescheduled uh, due to weather, and and they didn't realize it. So, which leads me to the next slide. And the answer is, of course, it does. Um, we see we're seeing some low-level inversion accidents where drones are taken off, or the winds are fine at the surface. Um, they're finding if it's time just wrong when an inversion is on its way down to the surface, they have gotten into trouble. There are probably lots of other drone accidents uh, that are unreported. Uh, We're seeing seeing some pilots get in a little bit of legal trouble. There's an example of a pilot who was flying it, who wanted to fly in downtown New York next to the Empire State Building for a customer. He wanted to gather some some video for a uh, promotion, and he. He, go, he walks there, he shows up, there's two cops standing there, and he asked the, the officers if he could fly his drone. They said, sure, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, so he flew, and at the upper part of the Empire State, uh, State Building, uh, he had some strong winds knock him into the building, the drone, drone crashed to the ground. He ended up getting a $200 fine uh, because they found out that, indeed, he could not fly there. So this was an issue of, of not uh, properly accounting for the weather or knowing the FAA regulations. Um, we also have some icing issues. This is something we deal with with the guard uh, aircraft um, uh, fairly regularly. Um, so, you know, once we see some more UAS flying and flying at uh, higher altitudes, this should be an issue. It's, it's, it's uh, hard to forecast for, hard to verify, hard to observe. Um, and then, you know, the whole attitude of, I think the attitude of you know, weather not mattering so much is because right now the industry is in a place where 
you know, a lot of these uh, larger organizations are doing a lot of, you know, are still in the testing phase. And so we'll look at a five day forecast such as this and uh, look, pick out the days that look great. You know, no weather to worry about. We're going to test on Tuesday. They go fly and things go, you know, without a hitch. And they're not connecting, uh, you know, the fact that when they start flying due to business, when they have a schedule to keep places to be, uh, packages to deliver that need to be somewhere at a certain time, uh, the weather's going to become uh, a much larger hindrance to what they're dealing with when they're out there testing. Um, so that is my presentation. Uh, anybody have any questions? Well, we're going to answer questions afterwards. Um, what we're going to do is try to get through all the presentations. But as the moderator, of course, I can add color. Of and course. everybody knows me well enough to know that I like to add color. But I guess um, one thing I want to point out uh, in one of your use cases, Gary, is when, when the puck was on the bottom of the drone, it caused it obviously to change the, the area dynamics of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, drone. And so the traditional um, wind that they look for to impact the ability to control the drone, uh, it actually turned out that the threshold dropped like five to seven knots because they just added that little half inch puck at the bottom of, a, of this drone that was very light. And I think, you know, I just wanna make sure we drive home the takeaway here. We got people out there doing like certification on these systems and they're not even using real weather data. Um, you know, the fact that they would, if Gary wasn't out there with the Visala equipment, they would have thought that their drone with the puck was fine if the winds were just stronger and they would have walked away not realizing they had changed the aerodynamics of that, that instrument, of that drone. How would they know that if we weren't there? So I'm, well, you know, I think the main takeaway there is there's, a, there's just stuff going on everywhere every day and, and the other point i want to make is that um the you know the faa themselves um we had um a, a representative from the faa uh i think his name was mike shea for drone response uh, drone responders and one of the things we're seeing is again um and i heard this from from operators uh on the call the drone pilots themselves their own leadership that are flying these drones at, in the fire departments and the and police departments, their own leadership doesn't take these drone, doesn't take drone safety seriously. They think these are toys. They somebody else used that quote. I'm not making the quote up. And we haven't done a good job in weather of training and educating uh, that weather complacency will become a problem, especially if one of those drones eventually hurts somebody and the pilot's actually responsible. For that liability, um, you know, we've 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 been pretty, I would say, lackadaisical about how we, you know, using Part 107 and and the definitions in Part 107, uh, telling them that they just can either go to weather dot you know gov or you know whatever, and they're not getting the data they need for the types of things we're seeing, and then these things occur. So we've got to really be, uh, you know, transparent about you know, some of the shortfalls that we have in the system. And we need to take responsibility to make sure we're educating folks because when they start flying beyond visual line of sight or further, it's gonna become a bigger issue. So I, that's my color for there. And we'll, um, we'll come back later and, and answer any questions. Um, so the next person that's gonna talk is, um, we got uh, Justin, Justin from UPS. Justin, you're up. Thanks, Don. Uh, I guess we'll get, uh, I'll let you guys drive on this one unless you want me to, just let me know. Matt, Matt should have it for you. I'm working as fast as my clicky finger will let me work. Be right with you. No worries. Okay, no problem. No, uh, I guess, Don, I'll go over here to the chat a little bit here. We were having a little conversation, me and Matt yes, were. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had asked uh, if the, the wind limits were different between 121 and 135 as far as sustain versus gust. And um, so far what we've seen is our, our manufacturer of the aircraft is the one who, who deems that wind limitation. Uh, and they typically will put both a sustain and a gust factor in there. Uh, if they do not define both of those, then we go with uh, the sustained to include gust as well. So if uh, it says 12 gust to 18, then we'll fly and sustain gusts or sustain winds of 12 and gusts up to 18. If it says wind limitations 12 
uh, then we would also include that as our, our gust limitation as well. Yeah, and I think this is something we haven't yet got our arms around. You know, we're in ASTM, we're working, really focusing first right now on the ceiling and viz. That's what Ralph's going to talk about later because there are just so many pieces to this puzzle. Uh, and and because the part because the cloud and ceiling is most consequential right now, uh, uh, you know, making sure there's enough clearance from cloud and 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 the three mile visibility that we've been focusing on that. But this is something we really do need to you know we need to drill down a little bit more. The problem, of course, is the drone manufacturers are making their own certifications of what the weather thresholds are, and none of them have been tested. And one of the things that some folks want to do, and especially in New York, they want to you know, want to start certifying, really certifying these these this equipment because drone manufacturers have a tendency to, you know, they don't, you know, they're not really if they're not tested and being watched. There's a question of how much emphasis or effort has actually been put into testing those certifications. This is another issue. Um, but yeah, let's let's get on with this. I see Andy, you wrote. Uh, I'll read your your text here in a second, and um, we'll let Justin press forward. Okay, thanks, Don. Yeah, so um, this is mostly geared towards drone operations, but it does absolutely apply towards uh, helo operations or any low-level weather out there. So you can go ahead and hit the next slide, please. We'll cover a couple different things through here. I know Don said we'll keep these short. I'll do my best to put uh, a lot of slides in here and a lot of information in a short period of time. So forecast model resolution, where we're at now, where we need to be. Uh, talk about METAR, satellite, radar, ceiling visibility, and wind. Uh, and then how input is really what makes your output accurate out there. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the easiest way to demonstrate to people uh, who aren't familiar with what our weather data looks like. Uh, the left side, your standard def TV from uh, back in the 90s or before, that's really the resolution that we have in the US today. Now you get in certain areas and you may have higher resolution that looks better than that. You might be able to read the numbers on the back of one of the, the players. But where we need to be is the micro weather environment because the drones are flying such short distances over over small range and the weather can change so drastically in a, a short period of time. Um, next slide, please. So just to give an example of, of what current weather models for forecasting look like right now. If you look at these three charts, you'll notice very small yellow uh numbers on each one of those laid out in a grid pattern so that grid pattern is showing you the individual points of resolution that you can get so imagine each one of those as a pixel on a computer monitor or a tv screen uh, we'll blow these up a little bit bigger uh, but for now we're going to focus on florida so go ahead to the next slide oh, damn it hang on hang on hang on <laughs> i'm multitasking and doing poorly at it there we go <laughs> I'm going to keep you on your toes on this one. Man, you guys are killing me, Smalls. <laughs> the, uh, so the first one here is your GFS model. This is a, a global version that has a 55 kilometer resolution. So each box inside of this is 55 by 55 kilometers. So I've highlighted that in the, the red box on here to show that any weather phenomenon that doesn't cross the edges of that box could potentially be missed. And so for an example, if you look in there, there's a little tiny thunderstorm cloud to represent the size of a, an individual isolated storm that's in there. Um, the other thing I want you to look at on here, you notice the CVS inside of that box. Around the CVS, there's a uh, satellite map of that area. So as we zoom in here for each model, you're gonna notice how much bigger that gets. Next slide, please. So first we have the, the NAM here. Notice the resolution increases drastically. You can see there's a lot more numbers on that screen and a lot more grid boxes. And now our thunderstorm actually fills out one entire box uh, so we're getting closer but we're still not where we need to be so let's look at the her next now we're way zoomed in here so you notice the satellite map that we had on the first slide that we could barely even make out um, has what is that about uh, nine grid points across each side of that and one box there encompasses an area that's uh, about the size of a we'll say a small farm uh, so you're down to the the maybe 500 acres or so range of resolution. And, and the biggest thing to note here is the thunderstorm cloud there that was the same size as we saw it on the first couple of slides there, now covers about five different grid boxes across. So that thunderstorm will likely show up. That's still at three kilometers, which is a very large distance. Uh, the future is 
those model resolutions, we'll be able to see a lot more. But within that red box, all of our current drone operations down in Florida operate inside one box. So we need a higher resolution as we move forward. So let's talk about METARs next. Have you ever seen these on the actual airport? They can be as, as simple as a windsock out there for your visual needs as far as helicopter operations going into an, uh, a hospital. Or if you're using certified observations or METARs, you can see how complex that instrumentation gets there. So as far as coverage as these goes, next slide. This is uh, each one of those green circles represents a five mile terminal area coverage of every airport in the United States. So as you can see, there is a massive amount of space not covered. Go ahead and click again for me. Total coverage reported by the FAA within the, the US is 3% of the United States has a certified weather observation coming from a METAR site from NAWAS station. Next slide, please. So let's look at our Florida operation. We're back to the same satellite map we were using there for the models. We've got three different airports that are, we'll call within range of our area of operations down at the villages in Florida. So Ocala up there to the Northwest, Inverness over to the, the West, and then Leesburg to the Southeast. So the closest airport to us and the closest certified observation that we can use is 12 and a half miles away from us. So how can we do better than this? Well, from a certified weather standpoint, we can't, but there are other resources out there. Next slide. This is just a quick snapshot of people um, like Matt or anybody else who set up their own personal weather stations at their home. Now, the problem with this is you never know what the siding looks like on these. You never know what the quality control is. And um, while they can give you a good idea of what's going on as a snapshot, you would never want to use this as an official observation uh, for an operation. So what other options do we have out there? Uh, next slide. Satellite. We want to look down from up in space. What can this show us? The problem is it's so far away, we don't get a whole lot of info from this at the low level. Next slide. So if we take a, a general look at Florida, Here's a, a pretty fair weather day, pretty common day down in Florida. What can we tell from this? So just looking at this, the southeast half of Florida looks pretty good. Go ahead and click for me. So generally we can tell that this area, which is over 50% of this particular picture, is very likely to be VFR conditions. Now, as we get closer to the northwest of this photo in the central Florida, go ahead and click again. It's probably still VFR out there with a, a occasional shower that may be interfering there uh, right as that that sea breeze starts to set up there on the western coast go ahead and click again and then up to the northwest just because there's clouds on here doesn't mean that this is ifr but to make a quick deduction there's a chance that that area is actually going to be ifr so from looking down from the top um, we can basically say yes it looks like it's a bfr or it's probably not or may not be, but we have no way to tell that for certain. Next slide. So what else do we have? You go from satellite down to the surface. Now we have radar. So why aren't we using radar um, as a primary means here? So here's a quick look. If you notice the key there, 4,000 feet above ground level, 6,000 feet above ground level, and 10,000 feet, depending on the, the yellow, the dark orangish yellow, or the blue on there. So go ahead to the next slide there. While we have a chance here, I'm going to have Matt put a poll out to everybody. And Matt, if you want to explain how they can do this, the question is, assuming drone operations are at 400 feet AGL or below, what distance must you be from weather radar to pick up rain at or below that height? And we have so our Justin, four options there. So Justin, in and everybody, in the chat, uh, the, the at 1.38 p.m. right now, I just put a link to a meeting pulse poll. It has a single question on it, the question that ju that Justin has put up here, and he's going to give you the answer like in about two minutes or three minutes. So this is a very short fuse, single question. This will take you 12 seconds. Click on that link. It'll open it in a browser. Take the, the one question, give it your best shot, and then let's let's see what, it, what, what comes out at the end. Ready? Matt, Go. Matt, you need to enable the poll. Oh, dang it. I thought I had everything done. <laughs> so. 
Let's see, where have I buried that little gem? Oh, here you go. Thank you, Matthias. All right, let's try it now. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and click on here too, just to, to see. Yeah, it is, it is active for me. So head over there and you get to choose five, nine, 16, or 50 miles to see which one of those you think, how close do you have to be to that radar site to be able to see the rain that's actually reaching below 400 feet there. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide here. And I'll talk uh, about two slides here as you go over there and, and click the, the answer. Okay, so I'm not going to go into uh, radar theory or anything like that, but at a, at a very basic level, just to explain uh, to anyone who doesn't know about radar, the further away from the radar site you get, the higher the scan becomes um, for multiple reasons. I won't go into the in-depth in stuff, but at a very basic level, the earth is curved. And as you shoot a straight line away from the earth, it will then appear to get higher off of the ground. So in this illustration here, you can see the first storm to the left is getting a, a direct hit through the heaviest part of the precip, the darkest green there. But the second storm that's a little further away is actually missing that heavier precip. So you'll get a, a much weaker echo off of that second storm. And then anything that's below that, you have no hit at all. Next slide, please. So I grabbed this out of uh, the Gibson Ridge software, the GR2, uh, or GR level three, rather. This is down in Dallas on Friday last week. They had some severe weather. And what you can see here, the radar site's right in the center of the screen. And you'll notice there's sort of a blank spot in the middle of there where you call that the cone of silence, where it's too close or above the radar site and doesn't actually receive any data. And then the further you get to the right side of the screen, you'll notice there's a slant line going up. And anything that's above that slant line is being missed because that's as high as the radar site scans there. The same is true below that as well, uh, but on this particular software, you can't you can't quite see that resolution. So I think our poll should be getting pretty close to the quick answer. We'll go to the next slide and we will answer it. And if you want to give me the the results first, and then we'll give the answer. Okay, we had uh, sixty five people take the poll. Seventy two percent picked uh, five miles. 20% picked nine miles, 6% picked 16, and 2% picked approximately 50. So good job, everybody. It sounded like you went with the safe option on that one. Go ahead and click and we'll, we'll highlight the correct answer there. So nine miles is actually the, the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Now you would also be correct to select five because most of what you're seeing there is below the 400, but on an average across the U.S. with an assumed flat terrain, you know, you're not going up or downhill near the radar site. Um, nine miles is about the cutoff to where you hit somewhere around 500 feet. So um, good job to all the pollsters out there. If you ever want to know this, you can click the next slide there for me. Uh, anybody that uses the Radar Scope app for iOS or for Apple, uh, and no, I don't make any money off of this, you can use the beam height tool to select a radar site and then drag that out. So there's uh, 8.9 miles from our radar site here in West Point in Louisville, Kentucky. And you hey. see, uh, once you hit that, it goes right to 0.5. Uh, hey, five. hey, Justin, you got a minute to wrap up. Okay, I'll zip through here on the next part. Um, just to get a visual of that, go ahead and click for me. Uh, click one more. So in Florida, the closest radar site we have to our site is in Tampa. Um, that beam travels 88 miles to get to us, and the bottom of the radar is at 7,900 feet. So anything below 7,900 feet, uh, we cannot see at all. Uh, go ahead and click a couple more. You'll see a map pop up with radars for the U.S. This one, uh, you can see how sparsely populated this really is when you're looking at low-level weather oper operations out there. Um, it, it's really not going to work as far as far into the future there. Um, because we do need to see below where the radars currently see right now. Um, go ahead and click to the weather station breakdown slide for me, number 27. So as far as the weather stations go, you've got many options out there. Um, the basic sensor is pretty cost effective, temperature, dew point, wind direction, wind speed. Uh, it gets really expensive when you try to add a sealometer or um, visibility to that. So you're looking at $18,000 just for a solimeter. Uh, out there. And, and it's just to set up a wide scale operation as far as the private sector goes, this is just not affordable 
when you're flying a drone that that may cost as much or less than um, what your weather sensor costs. Uh, go ahead down to the final final thoughts 29 for me. So with the FAA, everything's demonstrate and prove. Uh, that's that's how things get done through the FAA. So we have to demonstrate non-traditional methods to collect the weather data and then log and validate that data against existing FAA approved sensors. At least that's how, how I would see it. Uh, once we do that, we prove that alternate methods can be used as a primary for low altitude ops. Aviation sensors really have not changed a whole lot over 30 years, uh, mostly because of regulation and uh, sort of mon monopoly of the company that is approved to provide those those meet, those AWAS stations. But the technology has gone leaps and bounds further than where we are right now. Uh, so we've got new innovative solutions that may not be useful at this point for manned operations, but let's start with the unmanned or even for medical helicopters where you just don't have data. Um, one, one last slide here and I'll toss it back to Don. So right now we have this conundrum of which is better. We have certified data that's so far away that doesn't really even actually apply to your operation. You've got uncertified data where you can set up, whether it's a personal weather station or an enterprise weather station that's, that's not certified, that gives you a good snapshot that you feel that you can trust, but technically you can't, uh, or no, no data at all. And really the two options that we have right now is we either use the certified data or we don't use data. So uh, that's kind of a setup for what you'll see on the rest of this panel. And some of the solutions that we have will be discussed here uh, once I toss it back to Don. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you very much. I think the point there is uh, you don't want to be fake news, right? You don't want to be using certified data that has no relevancy to where you're flying. That's, that's almost the most dangerous thing because you give a false sense of complacency to these pilots. And that's what we're doing right now in our regs. We give them a false sense of complacency. Everyone feels good, but it's actually fake news. So, okay, I'm going to hand it over now to uh, Jeff. Jeff, you, it's up, it's up, you're up. And you don't have any slides, right? That's right. I don't have any slides. Um, okay. All right. So, yeah. I uh, I'm Jeff. I'm with Amazon Prime Air, which is the drone delivery organization within Amazon. Uh, I think Justin and Gary just did a great job, and Don did a great job outlining a lot of the gaps and limitations that are currently out there uh, with traditional aviation weather products. Uh, so the only thing I want to add, because I want to make sure there's plenty of time for discussion for this panel, uh, is that the this need goes beyond science and has real business implications. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the business side of, of why these things are important. Uh, and this is, of course, coming from the perspective of Prime Air. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Prime Air is going to be a 30 minute click to delivery service for Amazon customers. So you would choose an item on the website, uh, order it, and 30 minutes later it would end up in your backyard. Uh, this, this means that the actual flight time is quite short. Um, we we have a 15 mile range. It can carry a package up to five pounds, but you know we're going to be relying heavily on Nowcast in order to to make this go no go decision. And you know, Prime Air manufactures its drones uh, and you know has this end to end service. And so we have set our weather limits on our operations to ensure safety. So we have weather limits for wind speed, wind gust, temperature, precipitation, these kinds of variables. And if, if we think that weather conditions are going to be below these limits, then we don't fly that particular mission and we turn off the service. And, uh, and if we're going to be within limits, then, then we do fly and we do carry on. And these limits, uh, they they come from you know they're not just made up here they're they're they come from millions and millions of uh, simulated flights that we have in our simulator uh, where we're modeling the weather within that simulator we have you know super high resolution uh, wind and turbulence modeling to make sure we are capturing uh, extreme events and the and the tails of the wind distribution uh, they're also informed by real world flight tests. Uh, and then, of course, they must meet or exceed any regulatory requirement. So, so we we have a need for uh, for weather products that provide us with a risk of exceeding these limits for a mission. 
Uh, and again, as Justin and Gary did a really good job describing, the, the current products uh, are just not able to do that for us and meet that meet that use case. And there, there are two business metrics that I, I track really closely, uh, where investment in more accurate, more relevant, and more representative weather data can really help. So, so the first metric should be pretty obvious. It's just improve safety. Like we don't want to have a catastrophic failure. So if we have better weather data, then uh, if our weather limits are exceeded at any point, uh, that, sorry, then we can capture whether weather limits are going to be exceeded at any point during a mission, especially those edge cases. Uh, and, and then the second one is increases to our service availability or how often the service is turned down, turned on, how often we can fly uh, and deliver to customers. And better weather data here uh, provides us with higher confidence that we're not going to go outside of our limits. Uh, so if we have more confidence in that, then we can fly closer to those limits, closer to that envelope, and still be sure that we're going to maintain safety. And of course, these two metrics are in direct conflict with each other, right? Like the the safest thing for us to do is to never fly. <laughs> that's that's the common joke. If you want to be 100% safe, then we can't fly. Uh, but that obviously isn't a very good business model. And then on the other side, flying all the time, having 100% service availability, will that will result in unsafe flights uh, and, and dangerous action. So we have to improve both, both of these metrics. And the only way to do that is with more accurate, relevant, and representative weather data uh, for drone operations. And the current weather products just are, they fall short for us. So what we've been doing uh, at Primera is supplementing the, the current aviation weather products with, uh, with in-house measurements and modeling to help fill these gaps and help improve our safety and service uh, availability. But of course, much more research and development is needed in this area, um, which is you know one of the big motiva motivating factors for why I wanted to be on this panel and, and talk and hear other people's thoughts on it. Uh, so I, I, I can stop there, Don, and, and turn it over to you. No, I think I think we've effectively met the objective um, of covering you know some real ground truth inputs, and I want to move the process on uh, to the next panel so we can stay within the time scale. We, we you know all these are going to blend together anyway. So um, a question from Walter Rogers is what is VLOS? That's visual. Uh, VLOS is the um, is the uh, weather observing station. That's the camera, right? Is that the VLOS? The, that's Walter's uh, camera. Based observing station. Am I correct on that? Anybody yes, want to the visual weather observation system. Correct. Yes. Okay, great. And um, we high high resolution forecasts are needed. Uh, but I'm reading through some of these real quick to see if there's anything any hot questions in here. It's you know have high temperature. It's great. Uh, yeah, we got some input on a model. Models are as good as the data going into them. If we don't have better data, the models, you can run higher resolution, but it's not going to resolve uh, things unless we have data uh, inputs. That's what I've been learning in the field. Um, are you expecting resolution in the canopy? Eventually, we're going to have to be in urban canopy. Yes, if, if you want to know what the winds are doing on Fifth Avenue and you have a vertiport and it happens to be in the Ventura effect and the winds are blowing 20 knots stronger there than on the next street over uh, parallel or I should say, yeah, par uh, perpendicular, then yeah, we're gonna need Urban Canyon stuff. Um, yeah, so I think I got through some of these real quickly. I think we need to move on. Uh, Justin, I'm gonna let you take this panel and uh, uh, you know, we'll try to get through these slides a little faster so we can leave enough time to talk in about both of these areas, uh, both of these groups. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sounds good. Thanks, Don. Yeah, I think some of the questions that I'm seeing over in the chat over there uh, may actually get answered by our next set mm -hmm. of panelists here. So I'm not going to go too in depth on the bios for each person. If you want to see those, you can check those out. Uh, Matias put the link a little further up in the chat as far as where you can read the backgrounds of those. But um, the next panel we have here is a panel for remote sensing and the technology that we uh, are, are exploring and potentially look to use in the future. Uh, and what's available right now and where it, it will kind of go. So uh, we're going to start out today with uh, Gordy. 
He's an aviation safety inspector for aircraft dispatch in AFS 220, which is the air carrier operating branch of the FAA. Uh, and he's going to kind of lay out the problem statement and then tell a little bit kind of the history of, of where we've been and why we're going the direction we are. So I'll hand it over to you, Gordy. Do we see Gordy on the uh, on the master list of people over there anywhere? I'll uh, ping him on text. Okay. So Gordy's not on. He's on. I just got a text from him a little bit ago, but uh, I'll reach out again. He may be uh, doing a wire break or something. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, we were uh, in the FAA this week. We're having some significant issues with our VPN, so sometimes it just goes dark on you. And uh, anyway, uh, thanks, Justin. Um, looks like Matt's got my slides up there. If, uh, go to the second slide, Matt. I guess this is Matt controlling this, right? Um, so <clears throat> where we stand today, um, with, uh, cer certifying instruments or versus certifying data, that's, that's kind of the topic now. Um, liability is, is the biggest, um, biggest issue and, and liability, uh, has to be looked at, um, based on the acceptable risk. So we need we need to we need to move into a, a risk based environment. Uh, current currently today the AWAS ASAS standards um, are identified. Um, we have standards for the human observa uh, human observers and those operations. Uh, it's all well documented. Um, configuration management of the AWAS has driven the hardware specifications to a single manufacturer. I don't think it's any secret that Vaisla is the manufacturer. Um, which has really kind of suppressed um, the ability for other uh, other uh, third world third party uh, vendors to uh, come up with uh, novel approaches. So a combination of these uh, has restricted it, you know, restricted where we're at, and really limited the number of weather systems. Plus, the NAS is primarily driven around number of operations, commercial operations. General aviation has always been benefited from the, uh, the advancements in technology in the commercial uh, environment with regards to forecasting. And, um, and so, you know, primarily where the money, the, where the money uh, lands uh, to get this done is through uh, the taxpayer and, and paying of the taxes to get, uh, um, to get on an airplane. So the commercial operations have really paid for where we're at today, and uh, we need to evolve. Next slide. So uh, there was a, there was a comment um, why VFR, um, and you know we've got current um, visual line of sight uh, conducted under VFR. These these types of limitations, um, you know why why VFR for beyond visual line of sight? Well, it's the ability to integrate into the NAS. Transition from IFR to VFR, detect and avoid equipment will will have some risk mitigation, but um, it it doesn't necessarily fix the uh, um, current um, VFR operations in in manned aircraft. Um, the certification of the UAS vehicles we kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, currently, there's a process going on for certification. And in the certification of these vehicles, um, they are identifying uh, limitations, just like you would certify a, a large aircraft. You 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 identify certain limitations on uh, you know precipitation, turbulence, uh, icing, uh, winds. Those types of things are all being identified. So, um, what's the application? How how do they how do they meet that? Um, that's the big challenge. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, flight and flight and the conditions and the capability and the certification of these uh, UAS operations. I mean, somebody made a comment before they're they're going to be weatherproof. I think maybe Justin made that weatherproof, or um, you know, they can fly in the weather. Well, not necessarily, right? Any vehicle you put in the air is going to be affected by uh, by the weather, so you know it, it's going to have its limitations. 
For example, um, operations in visible moisture at temperatures below at five degrees C and below. I mean, that, that's the basic definition for icing. So how do you determine that? Um, temperature on the ground doesn't necessarily mean that the temperature aloft is the same, just like the winds we talked about had, had that. So you use, you use a standard lapse rate, you know, how do you make that determination um, if you're close to um, those, you know, those limits? Um, no operations within 25 miles of a thunderstorm. We've seen that too. The uh, impact of uh, lightning on 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 drones. Well, that's a that's a long distance from a thunderstorm, and as Justin uh, just clearly identified, the next red radar is not going to get us there. I mean, it really isn't. So, I mean, thunderstorms generally are going to be above that that those levels where you're flying, but still, the fact of the matter is, is it, it's not. It's probably not. Um, that probably doesn't have the fidelity to uh, to be able to identify that. So, so these are these are the issues that we're we're starting to scratch our head and go. Well, how can we how can we um, uh, identify these products? What what can be acceptable um, for uh, for battery life operations and temperature below minus ten degrees C? We've seen a number of those in these in the certification data. And so, you know, that uh, once again, uh, it's temperatures aloft. Um, we don't do a good sampling in the in the um, boundary layer. So these are all these are all challenges. So um, weather information must be made available uh, for the area of operation to comply with the certification limits. Can tell you that the FAA does not have plans to provide that information. So where do we go from here? Next slide, please. So really, we got to go to an acceptance of a data-driven weather information. So Don, very familiar with this. We'll probably talk more about it, but the ASTM F38 uh, group, um, they have a charter to, uh, to draft new specifications for UAS weather. We've talked to them about uh, developing it around risk-based levels of acceptable information. Um, for example, a UAS in, in Class G, which would be uncontrolled airspace, non-passenger, might have X acceptable, you know, some sort of uh, level of uh, hazard. Um, the acceptable weather parameters for that type of operation might be visibility plus or minus, you know, those types of things. So you go through the different weather elements and you determine what, what would be an acceptable visibility or, or ceiling information, however it's derived through data-driven approaches, you know, for, for that type of operation. Bottom line is the the higher the risk, the more accurate we're going to want to get the data. Uh, for, and, and I'll liken that to how we operate today with Category 2, Category 3 operations into airports. You know, we have the, um, the uh, ILSs are flight checked uh, to rollout. So basically they're flight checked all the way to the, to the rollout end of the runway. Um, so the, that equipment is checked. The ground equipment is checked. The the aircraft equipment is checked and monitored and, and controlled very well. And the weather information um, needed for that, you know, is going to require RVR. So when you start getting down to the real low, now we now we require, you know, more than one RVR, two RVRs, three RVRs, those types of things. So you start requiring more accurate data. Um, we see a very similar approach uh, for the higher risk UAS operations. Um, the other issue that that obviously is the underlying issue is, is hazardous weather avoidance, icing, turbulence, thunderstorms, those types of things, which, um, you know, are, are always a challenge. But, um, you know, th th that stuff is going to have to be identified at those low levels, too. So uh, operators will have the ability to, op you know, exercise positive operational control of their, of their flights. Uh, final slide here, just kind of summary. Um, so we're we're starting this gap analysis. Um, obviously, we know there's gaps. Uh, the MIT study has provided that a lot of that information. Um, the standards will be, you know, based on what we're going to get from uh, ASTM F38 working group. Uh, you know, we're going to look at uh, recommendations that they have and and work with them. Obviously. Um, you know, obviously, there's going to be a uh, a serious discussion as to how data sharing um, can be accomplished, uh, how, how cost sharing can be accomplished, because 
all of this is going to require some level of, of financial, you know, investment. Um, and the bottom bottom line is we have to make recommendations for the approval of the data driven weather systems. Um, Kevin Johnston is probably on. Uh, he um, was just given the task of of uh, you know coming up with a, uh, a recommendation on how to approve these third party weather um, providers, and and so that that unfortunately the FAA I, I you know I, we're probably a little bit behind the power curve on this, um, but the good news is is there's been a lot of smart people thinking about it. And so, you know, we just got to get people together to kind of come up with a plan for the future, um, realizing, fully realizing that we can't be putting AWAS's, you know, at a, at, a, at a half a million, million dollars a copy in, in all areas. But certain areas are going to require more information than an AWAS can provide, and that would be like the Urban Canyon, for example. So so those those operations, like uh, like Don was alluding to as far as wind goes, it's going to require more information to operate safely. So, anyway, uh, that's my presentation, and uh, we'll uh, turn it back over to you, Don. Oh, Justin. Or Justin. Yeah. Sorry, Justin. Yeah, I got you. No, perfect timing. You were down almost to the uh, the second there on your your ten minutes. Um, I see a lot of stimulating uh, comments going over in the chat, so we'll get to those once we get to the end of everybody talking. Next up, I want to hand over to to Rob Stoffler from. Raytheon, he's their senior solutions architect, and he's going to do uh, a little presentation on sort of remote sensing, especially for for ceiling and visibility. So, Ralph, the, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. So, uh, first, my apologies to everybody. I don't have any wonderful slides uh, in my last job. I worked for the government, and every time I gave a briefing with lots of slides in it, I either ended up in the Washington Post or reporting to Congress. So uh, I tend to not use slides whenever possible. So my, my current role here is, um, you know, Don enlisted me to, to be part of the ASTM F38 effort to help develop weather uh, data performance standards to, uh, to allow us to get on with making the U.S. mission uh, a viable way of going. And, and of course, you've already heard a lot of the challenges. Uh, and let me, let me wrap those challenges really up and uh, into what I would call uh, three key areas. I mean, one, you've all heard, uh, you know, in the United States, despite the fact that we have more weather data than any other country in the world, only 3% is covered by certified data. So that's a big issue. Uh, the second part of that is the majority of our discussion has been, we're trying to avoid hazardous weather, bad weather. We're worried about strong winds, thunderstorms, lightning, and all that. The reality check is, and this is uh, something which a lot of UAS operators are struggling with, even when it's clear and blue and 22 outside and there's no winds and it's perfect weather to fly, you still need to know what VFR is. So the question that the FAA always asks is, how do you know you're in VFR conditions? Uh, and with certified data covering a little bit of, of the area, uh, that's a big problem. And then we get to the last point, which uh, we have all talked about, in the fixed wing business or in the rotary wing business, you have this thing called the pilot. And the pilot with his calibrated eyeballs can determine VFR conditions. And so there's a significant reliance on uh, people to make weather decisions. Well, in the UAS business, that's not the case. Uh, there is no person in the cockpit. And in the majority of cases, a lot of the operators can't even see uh, outside of the UAS. So the bottom line is, how do we make determinations of, of what uh, VFR is going to be? Um, you've already heard the comment that, you know, simply go out and buying new things, establishing new sensors is a very cost uh, uh, related activity. And uh, you just heard comments from the FAA that the FAA really doesn't expect to provide the data. So industry needs to be providing it. And one of the first things I'm looking at is how do we leverage the data that we already have much better. The United States today has one of the highest resolution of remote sensing capabilities in the world. You've seen the pictures that GOES can do, GOES R, the VIR sensors off of JPSS. There's a lot of high resolution satellite data. And in the example that you saw from Justin, we can make determinations on VFR from that satellite data. So we've got an effort in place where we want to be able to do that. We need to use that information uh, and make appropriate decisions. 
The other thing that you've heard is the discussion on radar. Okay, so radar doesn't uh, doesn't cover the areas of interest, but certainly one thing which my company is doing, uh, we're providing a radar capability specifically designed to look at that 400 foot layer that UAS operators uh, are interested in. So we can track everything in the airspace. One of the efforts that we're looking at is that if we can demonstrate to the FAA that we can see all airspace users, uh, we can see where the drones are and we can see where the weather is, do we even need a VFR requirement based upon that? The other thing is we wanna really develop better algorithms and use other tools. You know, an example would be uh, when I worked in Europe with the military, uh, we had extensive upslope and downslope charts. And so based upon one ceiling observation, i.e. one observation from one AWOS, you could really determine cloud height, uh, which would be in compliance with VFR for a very larger area. We could examine doing that for UAS operations. You've already heard that if a UAS can fly a maximum of 20 miles, uh, does that mean if I've got one observation available that's maybe 15 or 20 miles away, can I use upslope, downslope, and other factors to extrapolate on what uh, on what I can do? Uh, that's worked very well for the military, and I think uh, that's something we need to look at as well. And of course, the real big deal is there's lots of other data sets out there. You know, we talked about the the great project in Alaska with FAA cameras. I think that's a super idea. But think about it: there are hundreds and hundreds of traffic cameras in every major city, smaller cities throughout the United States. If we had algorithms in place where we could use that traffic camera data for visibility and cloud determinations, that would go a long ways to giving us the right data sets that we need to fly these UASs uh, uh, where we need to be. So I think that's, that's something we need to explore and I'm gonna be working with NASA to see what we can do in that area. And of course, the final question that everybody talks about is, <clears throat> Why don't we just develop miniaturized weather sensors and stick them on the UAS itself? If the UAS has already got a camera on there, can't we use the onboard sensors to derive weather information and then collect that data to really create a net centric view of the operating area of UAS and then share that data with all the operators? That would be another great way to really improve our data collections considerably. And the ASTM standards we're working up is, has these ideas built into them. And we're also, as you've already heard, breaking them down into, you know, low, medium and high risk operations. Obviously, if you're flying a UAS uh, in, a, in an area where there's very little population, you're delivering out the, uh, you know, a package where few people live and there's little traffic. Uh, that's probably a, a low risk operation. Whereas if you're trying to fly near an airport uh, or in over a big city, that's more high risk. So we're, we're adjusting the standards based upon a risk. Uh, that will allow us to get into business much quicker. And, and I think a key thing we all need to realize here, and this goes for the future, we need to start thinking about, you know, unmanned aircraft. We need to think about machine learning and machine-driven decisions making and, and AI. Uh, you know, there's talk, you know, there's going to be more automated cars, automated airplanes, automated taxis, future delivery services. And uh, we really need to start getting ready for that because it's coming. Uh, and uh, if we're not ready for it, I think we're going to have problems down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Um, great discussion there and, and kind of where we need to go in the future. Um, we're actually going to bring Walter back in again. Uh, he, he talked a lot about the VWAS and the weather camera um, options up there that are currently Alaska, Colorado, a couple other places. But he is the FA weather camera program manager. And we thought his uh, earlier presentation was so relevant that we wanted to make sure that he could touch on that again this afternoon for anybody that is tuning in fresh. So I'll hand it over to Walter. And and uh, Walter, before you start, Justin, uh, this is where I put in poll question number two, correct? Sure. Go ahead and throw it out there so we can have some results by the end of his slides. It's it's out there. Uh, it was put in at 2.13 p.m. Once again, folks, it is a single poll question, and this time I've actually started the poll and the meeting, so it's available for your inputs ASAP. And I believe the plan, uh, if, if I remember correctly, was it after dawn is through uh, um, the, the, the next presentation, then we'll take a look and see what the, what the poll results tell us. 
We will. Yeah. So it's, uh, is moving towards certifying weather data a move in the right direction? And then that's a yes or a no. So do you agree or disagree with that statement? And uh, we'll check back uh, once Don comes on. So Walter, it's all yours. Okay. Um, I think there was a, a four slides that went along with, with this presentation. I don't know if Matt's got that or you, Justin. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I was asked to speak to the VWAS. It's a it's a development that that we're uh, working on right now, and and uh, uh, Gordy Rother has uh, spoken about it a little bit, and of course I had mentioned it in my previous presentation. Uh, we've got that little weather head that that goes with our camera system, and uh, what we've decided to do is to expand that to include visibility, uh, ceiling, and pressure. Uh, and to provide a non-certified data product that is validated or self-checked and self-validated for accuracy. So uh, in Alaska, we've got a huge dearth of weather information available, observations, I should say. Um, I don't know what the percentage in, in Alaska is, uh, uh, but it's it's got to be less than th the 3% that that we've spoken about several times here today uh, across the entire NAS. Uh, we do know that there's at least 160 airports in Alaska that desperately needs weather observations and accurate, dependable weather observations. So uh, we're, we're trying to use our camera systems and our, our footprint at those locations to improve the weather observation information that's available. Uh, so we've come up working with flight standards. Uh, we've started a concept of building what we call the silver standard. OK, so the silver standard is not a certified weather observation, but it's head and shoulders above all the rest of that weather data. Right now we've got the 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 gold plated uh, METAR, which is certified weather. And then right now the way we treat all the other weather is just that. It's just all that other stuff. We're trying to bring in uh, a new concept of self-validated, self-checked, self-reporting, and accurate, dependably accurate weather uh, uh, observation uh, with the camera system. So we've taken our cameras and we've developed a new kind of a, a, a new process to provide a 360 degree camera that you can pan, tilt and zoom in. So where we install this, you can look all the way around the terminal area. You can zoom out to, you know, to the uh, uh, mountain pass, for instance, uh, as you can see in the depiction here. Uh, you can zoom out to see what your weather is out there. You can also uh, uh, pan over to the, the runway to see and zoom down to see if uh, this the runway has been plowed, so that's that's the the camera aspect of it. We also have VIA, which is a part of it. That's that visibility estimates through image analysis uh, that that we're providing that will help uh, give us a a textual output or or a, a read on what our actual visibility is at the at that from that location. Um, <clears throat> We also have all of the weather sensors necessary to provide uh, what would normally be a METAR, a certified METAR. This would be a non-certified uh, METAR-like data product. Um, and specifically, we're trying to address the, the, um, the new legislation that uh, reauthorization bill HR 302, section 322 and 516. So, uh, where that legislation, for those of you that don't know, is specific to non-contiguous states, basically Hawaii and Alaska, uh, where pilots can use and, and the aviation industry can use weather data uh, at, at locations where a METAR does not exist. So they can use non-certified weather data. Uh, our concern, myself and, and, and the flight standards groups that I'm working with, and, and uh, Gordy Rother and John Steventon are a part of that group there, uh, but our concern was that with that new legislation that pilots are going to be using weather cameras. They call weather cameras out specifically in that legislation, and, and I didn't feel, and none of us really felt like that was adequate, and we really wanted to put a, our, our foot forward 
with regard to <clears throat> developing a better, more accurate weather product that pilots can use in lieu of an AWOS or ASOS system. Uh, this system, can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so this system is, is low cost, um, it's high availability, it, it highly dependable, and it will be highly accurate. Um, so, it, and it is intended to be installed at airports and locations where, where an AWOS or a METAR uh, does not exist. So uh, we have a test, a collaborative test and development program going on right now where we have four of these systems installed in Alaska. Uh, we have operators that are dedicated to testing it with us. So they're flying it and testing and giving us feedback. Uh, we're looking for everything under the sun from with regard to uh, its dependability, its uh, uh, accuracy, uh, ease of use, ease of access. Uh, and and that nature of things. So we're looking for how does this affect the safety and efficiency and the human factors aspects of flight decision making and access, safe and efficient access into these locations where these systems reside. We're adding a couple of other features to this platform that that will help tremendously in, uh, in Alaska and many places across the NAS. We don't have any communications to the surface. So RCO and, and RCAG comms, radio comms, uh, are often uh, non-existent down to the surface, maybe 2,000 feet and below. So we're adding a feature of radio over IP using our infrastructure to extend the uh, radio communications capabilities of pilots so that they can reach uh, or contact flight service and, and air traffic through that system. Um, we have those those four locations, Palmer, Eek, Tetitlik, and Healy River, where they're installed right now. The systems are up and operational. We're still optimizing uh, all of the features and the display of it, but that test and analysis is underway at this time, and it'll run through March of, the, of 2022, uh, after which we intend to, uh, we, we will come out with a formal report that describes the operations and 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 all the features and the, and the lessons learned and that nature of thing, and we're going to then take that and develop a, a performance specification. So what that means is, and and I want to kind of take a little tangent here, but it's necessary. Uh, what that what that performance specification means is that we're 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 stepping aside from the traditional method to implement, own, and certify a, an AWOS or an ASOS system. Today, and, and Gordy hit on this earlier, and, and I think Justin hit on it a little bit as well, but today we have the FAA uh, is the only entity in the world that can certify a, a, an AWOS or a METAR product and there's only one company in the world that develops those those sensors uh, so there is a, there's one manufacturer out there and and that's driven by needs i mean it, it we got this way honestly uh, we need to verify this weather this weather has to be uh, 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 valid or at least to the point of uh, risk adjusted uh, validity of this so in other words we don't want to put weather out there that we don't have confidence that it's accurate. So let's go attack that accuracy factor, right? Right now, everything uh, revolves around risk and liability with, a, so with, with reference to uh, data accuracy. So that's what we're trying to attack now. Let's find some new methods. Let's, let's, let's find a way to to validate for these systems to use machine learning and and uh, AI and other processes to validate the the operations and the outputs and use other data sets that are available to us for, as comparisons. So that's those checkpoints or those balances of those baselines that we can bounce against and say, hey, are we are we somewhere within an allowable threshold? Uh, of these outputs that we have more confidence in. So that specification is being built. Can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> so that specification is being, is a part of this project and our intention is to take 
um, I'll, everything that we learn from this little project uh, and and start developing a pathway for the industry to pick it up and and carry uh, it to the goal line. In other words, uh, we want to enable the industry to pick up the the you know this specification to the point that someday we'll, we're going to be able to say, hey, if you can install a system that performs in this manner, it uses these self checks for accuracy, then you too can play in the weather arena. Uh, you you um, you have to be this tall to ride this ride, and and if you are this tall, you get to ride the ride. Uh, that's the performance specification, and it and it what it'll do uh, in, in my estimation is it will it will unlock the um, proprietary nature of certified weather. That's where we want to go with this uh, eventually in the long run. Uh, we're starting out right now. It's 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 uh, a non-certified advisory weather product. Once we have confidence that we can meet or exceed the current operations of an AWOS or ASOS system, then we want to take it to the next level to have that uh, system certified. With that, Justin, I'm going to hand it back to you because I think I'm up on time. You were just perfect as well there, Walter. Thanks a lot. Okay. We we, uh, we love what you're doing because it used to be it works um, and it's too expensive to play in the space to get what we need. And uh, he's bridging a gap in there now that says there is new technology out there that is better. Uh, why aren't we using it? And as he gets to that silver standard and gets that certified at that level, it pushes so that we can change uh, from a private sector and get more players in that space, make sensors more readily available. And ultimately, the ASTM 38 Weather Group is uh, working all over that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Don Bershoff, who you heard moderate the first panel though, there. He's a CEO over at True Weather, and he's going to talk a little bit about the performance standards, ASTM, and kind of the future state of what the uh, F-38 Weather Group is looking for. And, and Don, this is Matt. Not only can you not do color, you're going to have to either be black or white, but not both. Go. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the slides. Let's just, let me just, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, everything uh, it, that's been said in the last uh, two panels and these panels has just been so, it's been so rewarding to hear. I think, um, you know, we, we have made a lot of progress in understanding the problem in knowing that the solution isn't in the past and understanding that, you know, to solve this really tough problem for drones and air taxis and, and you know, is going to take innovation and outside the box thinking. And I, you know, the work that the FAA is doing now and Gordy, you know, I mean, I, I loved your presentation. Um, I think, um, you know, Kevin's going to be working on, on the certification piece. Um, we got Ralph busting his butt trying to help us, you know, uh, figure out how do we, you know, open up the spigot here to get people flying beyond visual line of sight without constraining. So, you know, but not based on risk, right, but based on some old rules. And we just got to work it. And so I'll just say that um, the ASTM F-38 is the, uh, you know, we started this, uh, I was the founder of that group uh, about over a year ago. Um, and if you really want to have an input on these standards, uh, you're welcome to join. You write me an email. We'll get you on there. But we do need workers. We've had a lot of strap hangers, but we need workers. Um, you know, Ralph and I have day jobs, and we're not paid to do this. Um, and we want to, you know, we have done a lot of thinking. I've been working with Europeans uh, on ESA, trying to harmonize the standards across the pond. Uh, we're ahead of them in our thinking, uh, but there's still a lot of deep devil in the details, as Gordy said. And so we need to, you know, we need people that are going to get in there, roll up their sleeves and help us answer some of the tough questions that we have to address to help the FAA accelerate progress in this area because they can't do it all themselves either. And, and, um, and we owe it to the community to do this because we don't want to be the long pole in the tent for effective drone operations, profitable drone operations. We don't want to be the long, the sticky, you know, the stick in the mud. So I you know, I think we're heading in the right direction. And, you know, I'm, I'm just letting you guys know you can help. You can be part of this. 
we got to be smart. We, you know, modeling's going to get us so far, but I'm telling you, working at the ground level, we need real data. We're going to need real data. Modeling can get us so far. Machine learning only is as good as the data going into it. How do you validate something if you're not getting real data? I don't like validating a model based on an analysis of a model. That is just not acceptable to me. I've seen that for 35 years. I think we got to stop playing that game. We've got to recognize that that's a shortfall and we've got to figure out how to fix it. And we got to start being truth in advertising. And, um, you know, in terms of probabilities, I'm all for probabilities. As long as you can run the high enough resolution, whatever you're going to run, whether it's probabilistic ensembles and blah, 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 you know, you're not going to get probabilistic data from a 12 kilometer ensemble that's going to get you to the micro scale at 200 feet. It's just not going to happen. And it's going to be crap in and crap out. So, you know, I'm challenging the community to think this through because if we re- we're going to get measured now on real results, there's going to be no more gain. You know, pilots got us out of trouble for many years when we are forecasting and measure. Up. These drones and these folks, there's millions of them and they're flying and we're going to be tested. So, you know, are we going to be able to, to you know, raise our game? So that's, you know, that's all I'm, I wanted to say. I think there was a really a lot of good, um, you know, communication in the, uh, a lot of good ideas, data off of drones. Absolutely. You know, we need that. It is a challenge to pull data, uh, a weather data off of a drone from flight control and telemetry because every drone is different. Software is different. And it's, it's, it, you know, if anyone has a universal, uh, you know, application for that, I'm, I'd love to talk to you. Um, that we can put on any drone, you know, pull out data off of any drone and it'll work the same way. It's a big challenge. I believe me, we've looked into it. Um, but I think that we need to, um, you know, face up to, you know, these challenges and we're capable of doing it. We're smart. Right? We're, I mean, we're great. This is the best country in the world. We can pull this together. So that's what I have. Back to you, Justin. Thanks, Don. Um, so we've got our poll up here right now is the, uh, the question that we asked uh, at the presentation before there is heading towards certifying weather data and move in the right direction. Looks like 46 people answered that and uh, 80% of you said, yes, this is the right direction. And we 100% agree with you. Uh, we we want to move towards a direction where the process is not uh, a year and a half long and a half million dollars just to get a stamp of approval to use your data um, or to use your sensor rather to certify your sensor. But while we want to continue with the certified sensors, we also want to supplement that and, and head in that direction of, of data certification versus instrument certification. So uh, a great, complete put together presentation there by everybody that participated. Uh, and thanks, Don, especially for really organizing and getting getting this whole panel together and uh, and everybody that participated in it. And Justin, with that, you. I just want to say one thing. Thank, thanks, Justin. I would love to, you know, I really seriously would like to hear the 20% of what their concerns are. You know, I think that if you have a concern about this, you need to come join the ASTM F38. You need to tell us what those concerns are. We want to make sure we're not missing something. You may have something that we're just not thinking about. We need to know. And if you're not telling us and and compete and and presenting that into us, then how are we going to know? Right. So I really want to hear about, you know, um, what the concerns are in that 20%. So Justin, I just wanted to say that um, before we hung up. Yeah, it should be okay. nine people that are typing yeah. over right now in that chat room and saying, this is why. <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> you you did right. the math, Justin. I did the same thing. And uh, I, I wonder how many that was. And I was doing the math in my head when I saw that number. But but you're you're right. And folks, uh, as you all know, you know, we've all been doing this for, God, a year and, and change now. Uh, you know, all, all this data is captured, the meetings being recorded, and and um, one of the things that, that we will do as, a, as an FPAW is to, with our session leads, go back through the chats, and if, if we've got stuff hanging out there that hasn't been answered or responded to meaningfully, then we'll try to, try to uh, remember, we, we too have day jobs, we'll try to get those answered and push back out and, you know, make those connections that we need to make. <laughs> All right. Great job. Thank you, Steve Dar, for putting the whole enchilada together. Thank you, uh, second half uh, uh, panel session leaders, for uh, moving us right along. 
And uh, without any further ado, Matthias, unless you uh, have something else that I'm overlooking, I think perhaps we uh, we hand this off to Tom Ryan to take us home. What do you think? What is Absolutely. Happening? Tom Ryan, go ahead. Oh, is Colleen trying to say something? Sorry. Oh, never mind. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks, guys. Those great presentations. So the next uh, presentation, just an hour long, and it's designed to keep us updated on some of the activities that we've talked about in previous FPAW presentations, and, and largely because of their impact on our community. Three presentations coming up. First is by Bill Bauman, who manages the FAA's uh, next-gen aviation weather division. Bill's going to be updating us on the FAA's weather community of interest. After that, Josh Paris uh, will be talking uh, about some uh, runway friction prediction activity going on at Minneapolis St. Paul. And Seth Linden will be supporting that as the software engineer that's actually worked it. Finally, Mike Robinson's going to come on and he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, the impact that COVID has had on aviation weather, some of the implications and opportunities occurring from it. So I'll get out of the way here and uh, let Bill take it over, sir. Go right ahead. 